There's no doubt about it that inflation, inflation, inflation is the key to market direction. Eventually, we're going to see a more significant pullback in risk assets and equities. Right now, it's a market that's trading on whether inflation is coming in better or worse relative to expectations. The Federal Reserve funds rate is going to go above 5% up to five and a quarter. This narrative of now pivot to pause is one that is just not yet backed by the Fed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keene. A holiday lengthened work week. Good morning, everyone, on radio, on television. A really eventful week coming up with lots of mystery, including, we're going to get to this, Mr. Iger uh, rejoining uh, Disney and all the rest. China we've got to talk about as well. But the major discussion at my house, Lisa, was simple. Ina Garten, do you put sour cream in your mashed potatoes? Yeah, you I really mean, these are the kind of discussions this week that matter. The big week. It's the <clears throat> biggest, most eventful week you could ever imagine. Right. How much are we going to fight over the turkey to see whether we put sour cream on it and whether we discuss Bitcoin over the table? I really do wonder. I mean, honestly, this is not a very eventful week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's pretty good. But what we are getting is a lot of year ahead reviews. And I find that interesting because they're coming out during this exactly. holiday shortened week. Exactly. Maybe don't look at this. We'll revise it in March. And you're getting them. And there are some consensus trades that you're starting to feel even in the turmoil that we're seeing. Yeah, we're going to talk about that as, as well, including some disinflationary uh, talk. Chef Patel will join us here to start us off. Margie Patel will join us in Boston here uh, in a moment. Just let's very quickly go through some of the immediate headlines. I'm not surprised. This is a cultural issue. Iger back in at Disney, not as chairman. And I'm sorry, I've always said this. Entertainment is about creative. And what this was is a failure of creative. Iger comes back in to jumpstart Disney creative. What this is is about Walt Disney Company facing its worst year of stock losses, potentially going back to the 1970s. But they had a lot of company. They had a lot of company, and yet they are uniquely in pain due to perhaps the uh, amount of money that they're hemorrhaging from Disney Plus, trying to rationalize the billion-plus dollars of losses that they've <clears throat> seen there. How much does well, he really revive that, considering that Bob Iger kind of founded some of these yeah. uh, online streaming movements? Stock 203 down to the 86 level, I believe, and then up to 90 and up nicely at today. So we're going to talk a lot about this. We're trying to effort some of the true experts on this. But again, Lisa, to me, everything here is culture. Wall Street's culture, entertainment, the pixie dust of Hollywood is culture. And this is just a cultural discussion. Chapek out, Iger in. And it's the culture also of activists getting more involved. Suddenly you have more activist investors that are uh, going to be kind of pushing things around a little bit more. The other aspect of this is how much are we going back to a pre-pandemic norm for some of the entertainment companies, some of the tech companies that really built up in 2020? in 2021 when they were the only <clears throat> game in town. And I wonder that was some of the tech layoffs, right? Twitter yeah. is unique with 75% of the, the staff cut. Yeah. But is it, right? I mean, are we going to start to see layoffs that start to seem pretty momentous? Yeah, and I like companies? the phrase somebody had this week, tech session, I thought was pretty interesting. And you wonder if it expands out from that. We've got to talk about China. Yesterday afternoon late, I said to someone in the family, I said, this isn't normal. This is two, 300 cases. Maybe it was in Beijing. I can't remember as well. Boom, in the Chinese Monday, uh, they begin to recalibrate. The first uh, death from COVID in quite a while in Beijing. Three deaths, 87, I believe, yeah. yeah, the 87 year old man starting that off. And so you start to see curbs come back. But this really speaks to the, how much hope was baked in the market that perhaps China would move away from zero COVID, even though China kept saying, no, we're not. No, we're not. And so here you are. You're seeing that a little bit in some of the price action. But there is a feeling that China has right. to move away eventually. End of current. Scheduled to join us. Let's get right to the data here. Yes, it's a holiday week. But yes, we continue to watch. Uh, equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, futures with a weight to them, negative 21. Dow futures, uh, same kind of idea. Actually, Dow is a little bit better on a percentage basis. NASDAQ down seven-tenths of a percent. And the VIX was a 24 level, 23.93. I'm going to go right to it. We had a 15,000 handle on Bitcoin. It is fragile this morning. 16,114 down fractionally. But 15,000 handle is not 16,000 reality on Bitcoin. In the bond market, Lisa, help me here. The 10s, 3.83%. Two-year, you know, it's, I'm going to call it a churn of non-new. News, and yet there's that inversion still negative 71 basis points. People expect the Federal Reserve to have to hike rates pretty substantially into weakness, <clears throat> and that is going right. to lead to further curve inversion. 
I'm curious to see whether we get any Fed speak that really discusses that. And week. before, this is really important, and I think it's a sleeping time bomb. West Texas Intermediate, American Oil, 79.70, and for, for American Oil to migrate down into the low 70s would be a huge deal in this holiday uh, week. It's amazing to see oil come down. Are you briefing today or because of the holiday do we are we brief free? I'm I'm briefing, but brief light. So let's just go through it real quick. The Fed speak that we get today, we do get some San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly Good. speaks uh, yeah. from 12 p.m. Eastern to 1:45 p.m. How much does she talk about what we've seen in terms of what a pivot means? And this is something that's important. People are talking about a pivot meaning the Fed stopping. Other people saying no, a pivot is when they actually move from a restrictive to a less restrictive stance, which isn't going to come right. for a very long time. We also get auctions today. I've said, well, we'll get here. Well, uh, please, we'll, we'll get, get to the auctions yeah. in a moment. I want to do a shout out, Mary Daly. I think she is the most interesting Fed official with first order economic skill. And she came from a really tough background. This is not some uh, person that grew up in the suburbs with a silver spoon in her mouth. I think she's got a very unique perspective for Fed officials. Becoming hawkish as you <clears throat> see people in the lowest incomes seeing the most pain, she really brings unique perspective to this. We're also going to be uh, getting earnings today, including from Zoom video communication after market. This is a, a chart out. of their <clears throat> stock over the past five years. Kind of shocking to see the round trip. We got as high as nearly $570 on the shares, and currently they are trading right. at uh, uh, you know substantially less than that. It's just sort of shocking to see how much of a round trip, $81.64. I'm yeah. curious to see whether they can deliver on that. And then today, this is what everyone's actually watching, which is the World Cup. And the games that we have today are England versus Iran at 8 a.m., Senegal versus Netherlands at 11 a.m., and U.S. versus Wales at 2 p.m. Secretary of State Tony Blinken will be attending that game. Secretary of State John Farrow looking towards <laughs> yeah. the 8 a.m. England, Iran. There's, uh, yeah, I, I skim it. I, honest to God, Lisa, I'm like you. I really don't focus on it. But after the 14th article in the Telegraph in three hours, you know, you sort of skim the headlines. And at, at the minimum, we can state, boy, do they take this seriously. I well, mean, it's England, Iran, but. You know, they might as well be playing, playing Germany today. We do, too. And we'll be talking more about that <clears throat> later on because we're such experts in it. Right now, Margie Patel will join us and we start strong. This is in Lisa Bram Bramowitz demanded that we start with Patel today. And we do. Margie, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I was talking about you cooking up a storm uh, in uh, Boston uh, this weekend with the distressed bird. I'm sure you'll make something of it. How distressed is the bond market? Mm -hmm. Oh, the bond market is in very good shape, uh, particularly high yield. Uh, in fact, I would say, if anything, there is actually a supply scarcity of good quality high yield paper to buy. So we've had yield spreads widen out only 100 or 200 basis points more than the Treasury move. So high yield bonds year to date have far outperformed Treasury's mm -hmm. investment grade. Uh, it's really more lack of lack of supply for buyers right. to buy. Michael, and uh, defaults are under 2%. Michael Darda, in his weekend note, is heated that the market is wrong on higher. He's looking for inflation and rates will fall meaningly. That's an opportunity for Maggie Patel. Given a disinflation or price up yield down, where's the best place to play? Uh, in the in the bond market, I think that better quality high yield is a very good place because if we have a real slowdown, if we have deflation, we may see defaults go from 2% to 4 or 5%, their historic average. So that says take a little bit of risk and say a double B name, get less yield, but you'll be able to keep it and not lose your principal if there are higher defaults. How much are you looking at stocks underperforming next year? We got some outlooks from a number of Wall Street banks, and pretty much they are unanimous that next year is not going to be great for U.S. equities. Do you agree? Uh, no, I really don't. I think it's really, uh, at this point, up in the air. A lot depends on what the Fed does. Uh, if the Fed slows down their very rapid rate of increase, will that allow us to avoid a recession? Uh, I think, on a relative basis, we'll still be better off than just about any other country in the world. And because people are so uh, wary of this risk, that, may, that says to me maybe there's a lot of money on the sidelines that would like to come in if it looks as if the air is clearing and the Fed is stabilizing or we miss a recession. Can you do it at the headline index level, or do you have to be perhaps a little bit more sector-specific based on what's happening in tech? 
Well, I think you have to look at sectors. Uh, I think the technology has had a lot of problems. It's one of the big underperformers this year. But if you go back, say, to 2000, when the market crashed, uh, tech was much, much more overvalued. The crash was much bigger. The recovery took much longer. This time, a lot of tech names, uh, some of the semi names, are very reasonably priced for their long term growth. Still volatile, but the PEs are down closer to what the expected growth rate will be. So we think a lot of parts of the tech market is, is pretty attractive here. Margie, you have been fearless about looking at equities for dividend growth and as an income trade. Is that true now? I think so, because you've had such a big uh, correction in equities. Uh, you really put the dividend yield, the cash flow yield, where it is actually competitive with investment-grade bonds. So if we have any kind of a growth in the economy next year, it says to me equities will outperform. I think 23 will probably be a rather muted total return year, but I still think equities will do better than bonds. Margaret Patel, thank you so much with Allspring Global Investments. It's just wonderful. And good luck with the distressed bird uh, as, as well. Lisa, uh, John from Coventry emails in in front of the TV set uh, oh, just before England, uh, two yeah, hours away exactly. from England. John says, Tom, you went right over the auctions. What the hell are you doing? The auctions today, there are two auctions. How dare you? I mean, I know. honestly, this is uh, pretty much form. the most important John would have sat on today. It. Well, <laughs> we'd basically be blowing up the show. It would be auction uh, Monday ahead of Thanksgiving. 1 p.m. we get $54 so billion dollars of 13-week bills and $43 billion of five-year notes. The five-year notes are most interesting to me. How do we deal with longer-term inflation? That has been the biggest distinction that I have seen over the past couple of weeks. Suddenly, people are starting to talk about disinflation and outright deflation mm -hmm. in a greater number of different sectors. Do you get that feel in some of the auctions? Does the auction do well, really well? Do people flood in because this is an area of yield? And in this week, as Lisa mentions, we begin to look forward to 2023. We'll keep you abreast of the different Wall Street, global Wall Street reports on that. I should say futures at negative 21. Uh, oil, I'm watching 7970 West Texas Intermediate. Bitcoin, 16,000. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, Chinese stocks and the yuan retreated as a string of reported COVID deaths and tighter restrictions in some districts gave investors a rude reminder that the path to reopening will be rough. A city near Beijing that was rumored to be a test case for restrictions across China has asked residents to stay at home for five days. A potential sign officials are reverting to tighter COVID zero curbs. Meanwhile, the country's first COVID-related death in almost six months has sparked concern that Beijing could see a return of restrictions. The U.S. and Chinese defense chiefs are likely to meet for their first talk since Beijing suspended dialogue with Washington over House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's August visit to Taiwan. A Pentagon spokesman says U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin would welcome a meeting with Chinese Defense Minister Wang Fengei. Now, it's the latest sign that ties between the two nations are stabilizing. The COP talks in Egypt have ended with an agreement to help developing nations face the devastation of climate change. Although that deal is for a loss and damage fund it paid for by rich countries is seen as a breakthrough, but negotiators failed to agree further cuts in CO2 emissions. Equity investors hoping for a better year in 2023 will be disappointed, according to strategists at Goldman Sachs Group, who say the bear market phase is not over yet. Strategists, including Peter Oppenheimer and Sharon Bell, predict markets will reach a final trough next year before a strong rebound. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. United States probably need to be careful about our evangelizing influence. I don't think it's really for us to tell China how they should organize their entire <clears throat> society. I think we're going to need to be very careful with respect to our diplomacy 
Warren Summers there, committed to Wall Street Week, and we thank the former Secretary of Treasury for his comments on an often basis here on his economics and also, of course, the way economics folds into the Atlantic and Pacific uh, society. Lisa Bramlinson, Tom King, John Farrell's off today looking towards England and Iran. We'll do that in an hour and 45 minutes. We'll keep you abreast of that with surveillance World Cup coverage as well. It has not been a surprise, but yet here it is in China. There is again rising COVID. Enda Curran joins us now, Chief Asia Economic Correspondent here. And Enda, you and I were talking about the symbolism of a hospital in Hong Kong from the 1930s, the Queen Mary Hospital, which is maybe where those tea leaves are discovered in your Hong Kong. Is Hong Kong like the rest of China with COVID, or are there certain zones where things are worse? There are some parallels, Tom. Hong Kong does have rising cases at the moment. People are watching what's going on with the hospitals and there are warnings that the hospitals are filling up again. Now, if you extrapolate that to what's going on in, in mainland China, well, there we know that cases are surging. We know that we've had the first reports of fatalities in six months, and we know that we are heading into winter in China. And of course, all the warnings throughout the past year or so with since the arrival of Omicron, which has tested COVID-0, mm -hmm. has been all about it's been all about can China's hospital network withstand an outbreak, especially China's regional and rural hospital network. There are plenty of experts who say it will be put under a lot of pressure. And of course, is the vaccination rate, especially among the elderly, at the kind of level that you need to protect well, your populace. So. In our reporting this morning, folks, and this is the depth of the Chinese reporting at Bloomberg, we have age 80 vaccination with booster only at a stunningly low 40%. That equates to, I'm going to say, 90% in America. Is this the moment and the current where Beijing gets on a first-name basis with Pfizer in Moderna? Well, you know, China have, have not embraced the Western vaccines. Uh, they certainly have been pushing their own Sinovac vaccine. There's never been a good explainer, though, I think from the outside looking as to why the vaccination rate among the elderly hasn't been at the level that it could and should be. Tom, there's a view that China has wasted the kind of the good COVID years when it was keeping the disease out and not getting the population inoculated. By the way, similar story in Hong Kong. There were parallels to the elderly population here were not protected. And when it broke out, then we had a major crisis on our hands. So there hasn't yet been a satisfying explanation, I think, on China's vaccination rate. But there is a lot of focus on, A, do they start to ramp that up among the elderly? And then B, to your point, where do they go with the vac Western vaccines and therapeutics? Do they eventually embrace them? Do they allow them to be used in the populace? These are core metrics that are core signposts that people are looking out for, I think. And this doesn't sound wonderful. It's not as terrible as it has sounded. And yet, when you take a look at the Wall Street analysts' expectations for 2023, almost universally, they are all overweight China. They all ex expect some sort of recovery in the stocks and bonds of the second biggest economy in the world. Is what you're seeing on the ground consistent with that, that we've seen the worst, and now it's just going to be about recovery and how quickly this nation can do that? So two things are going on. We had that pivot, Lisa, on real estate, as you well know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that the, Basically, the message from the government was continue to support the real estate sector, the banks and everyone involved. That has lifted expectations for China's economy. Economists are saying that's a game changer. And on the other side, on the COVID side of things, we had that pivot. We can argue what the extent of it, but we had that signaling from Beijing that they are on a path to COVID zero eventually. We have had messaging even today in the state press saying, you know, let's not have the broad-based lockdowns or mass testing we've had. Let's be more targeted and smarter in containing COVID. So that's what's buoying the optimism for China, that maybe there is a way out. But let's not forget, we are going into winter now. It's going to be a huge test of how they do navigate COVID uh, especially their trajectory to move away from COVID zero. And of course, on the other side of things, we have the real estate story has a long way to go. You know, both COVID has a long way to go in terms of lifting all restrictions and the real estate story is far from ending its slump as well. So there's a basis for optimism that maybe it's hit the bottom, but that doesn't mean a full recovery is, is, is in any way underway just yet. How does the Tony Blinken trip to China really uh, shape this narrative as well heading into next year? 
it's more about good mood mood music lisa again there's a view that maybe the us <clears throat> and china put things put things on hold for the moment have called time out on those tensions again nobody's talking about any of these structural underlying issues being resolved but when you have the governments the officials talking to each other on climate change or on security or on economic matters the thinking <clears throat> is that's obviously that's obviously bodes well compared to where they were before the G20 meeting between the two leaders. Right. So I, I would say better mood music, but it, does, it doesn't solve any of the underlying problems. And uh, very quickly here, are you sliding like a 12-hour work week here in football mad Hong Kong? I was at the Concord Hotel there once and there were four games on at the same time. I mean, does Hong Kong stop for the World Cup? Hong Kong is a big football city, Tom, uh, absolutely is. The difficulty this time around is the time zones or the time of the games over in Qatar aren't great for us. So I don't think anyone expects the bars of one Shire Lang Pai Fung to be as packed as they were <clears> in previous World, Cup, as previous World Cups. But there will always be the diehard fans who will be out and about watching it for sure. See how he said that he slid yeah. <laughs> by. Did you see how he said. But Tom, you knew the answer to that. Of course. Well, you know, we did it. We did our, you know, World Cup chat. A and the current. Thank you so much for providing color. And seriously, no one that talks to team surveillance does it like Enda Curran in his late evening, uh, in Hong Kong. You mentioned earlier the view to 2023. Anthony Dwyer and Michael Welch at Canagor Genuity out with a missile, and he's it's it for Dwyer. I mean, Dwyer's an optimistic guy. I mean, he, you know, this he is thinks not an optimistic the note. U.S. will beat Wales. And, and this is not an optimistic note when bad news becomes bad news. And look at that. Don't buy the pivot. Yeah, if a recession is coming, don't buy the pivot. Basically, this is something that John's talked about, which is if the Fed does not cut rates into a recession, if they hold rates where they are and, and the, uh, the, the economic trajectory is, is slowing, that is restrictive even if they're not hiking further. And Bank of America put this out well. They said, to us, a pivot isn't stopping with rate hikes. It is cutting. And that is not going to be necessarily on the table for a while. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. But certainly for Mr. Dwyer, who's made a career of linking equity drops to recession, this is a unique note. He says, here's the recession, and he has trouble going long. But, so Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson over the weekend coming this. out today, he basically was defending some <clears throat> of the hate mail that he was getting on his projection that the S&P could fall to 3,000 before going back to where it is right now. It's about a 24% decline from where we are now. And he basically said that people are pushing back, saying, you're crazy. And he's saying, look, we have to have some earnings pain if you're going to see the recession that so many people are expecting. We will see. We've got a wonderful set of guests coming up. I was actually thinking this weekend, I hope we can get Dr. Weinberg on. Carl Weinberg is going to join uh, soon. Futures at negative 21, Dow futures negative 79. The VIX elevated a bit of tension, 23.95. Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance. Serenos, good morning, everyone. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King. John Farrell on assignment this morning at 8 o'clock, scheduled in Doha, England, uh, Iran. We're Is that his assignment? To, that's his assignment today. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like a World Cup assignment that nobody's, you know, I mean, can you blame him? I mean, the guy's encyclopedic on this. Can I go you know, on I assignment, too? I can't too? wait for him to get back. I think back. we should all go on yeah. assignment. I mean, the final's December 18th, so we got a long way to go. There's like 14 brackets and... You know, did you watch yesterday? I watched the highlights, and I felt oh, really bad for the Qatar gee. team, honestly, because yes. they, they their their nation had built up this entire ecosystem around it, and then they just froze. They yeah. didn't show up, and Ecuador absolutely well, crushed the them. Nobody was good. left yeah, in were. the stadium, and so you know, you wonder whether they can bring it back. <clears throat> Three mandated games, right? Televisions Guaranteed. clicking off, radio stations changing worldwide as you and I talk <laughs> football. Let's move on. Futures negative 21. And, of course, we're watching Disney. We'll have some coverage of Mr. Iger back to Disney as well. We just spoke to our wonderful Enda Curran in Hong Kong about the moment again for China and COVID. Right now with the data, negative 21. Rates are giving me no help today. Oil a little bit light, 79.68 on West Texas Intermediate. And some dollar strength finally. We catch up on a narrow topic with Carl Weinberg. He's Chief Economist, Managing Director at High Frequency Economics. Dr. Weinberg, I have noticed it's not my chart of the year, but it well could be. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index compare between the United States and the EU has never been wider. Europe, on a financial conditions basic basis, is flat on its back. 
What does that mean for the ECB in terms of their efforts to be responsible and to do quantitative tightening? Hey, good morning, uh, uh, Tom. Thank you for finding something on Bloomberg that even I couldn't find uh, in terms of the financial conditions index. Um, what we're looking at, what we're highlighting to readers of high frequency economics this morning is a huge change in what you just described. Uh, the ECB's monetary stance is going to take a huge step tighter on Wednesday morning specifically. They have raised the rates on their repos. Banks have the opportunity to pay them back. They've signaled 296.2 billion euros worth of long-term right. repos are going to be paid back on, on Wednesday morning. That's going to increase the stock of bonds available to the market by 296.2 billion euros in one day. And that should be a, a massive step toward reducing real money supply, getting rid of the excess cash balances that are out there, and more importantly, uh, increasing the supply of bonds and raising long-term yields. Well, if they do this, and I'm going to use a phrase from Jean-Claude Trichet, he would talk to me about how economics diffuses differently through Europe. I get that if we do QT in America, what it means for Montana and Mississippi— how does it diffuse across these nations? It is a slower process in Europe to get the impact of this out into the market. When the Fed undertakes QT, it sells bonds to the market. So people immediately exchange liquid cash for less liquid or illiquid bonds, and that immediately affects their behavior. In Europe, the bonds are being returned to the banks. They were held as collateral against repo agreements. So the banks then will take their time or whatever time they take to sell those bonds back to the market, because why on earth would a bond want to be, would a bank want to be holding a bond when the price of that bond is sure to fall, right? They're better off in cash. So uh, I think those bonds will get to the market, but it will take a little bit longer than the QT impact those in the United States. As Tom says, this sounds very narrow, but the implications are as broad as you can imagine. There is a feeling that when you head into a downturn, you invest in duration, you head into long-term government bonds of developed nations, certainly what's happening in the United States. Are you saying over in Europe and perhaps in the U.S., that is not the correct trade, that you're gonna see yields on the longer end, on longer-term uh, treasuries and gilts and boons go up, not down, into a downturn. Well, Lisa, if we're not at the top of the Fed tightening cycle and we're barely approaching the top of the inflation cycle, bond yields are going to go up with or without QT. It's just a question of how far. So the QT makes the bonds look less desirable. It also raises the rate on long-term lending, uh, and that in turn uh, depresses the economy because it discourages borrowing to invest. It discourages, we've already seen it in the housing market and mortgages. So yeah, long-term interest rates are probably going to go up from here. That doesn't mean the yield curve can't be inverted and that it can't continue to be inverted. And it certainly doesn't mean, you know, anything. We're still going to get a recession at some point, although maybe not right away. Uh, but we are going to see higher long-term bond yields. Okay. So for how long? And I ask this because a lot of people are saying that the Fed does want to bring inflation under control. So does the ECB. And they're going to inflict quite a bit of pain in order to get that. Are you saying that they don't have the conviction to do that or just that all of the financial engineering over the past couple of decades is coming home to roost and that that long end will continue to go up for a longer period of time with higher real yields. Well, Lisa, I think that this whole process has a finite end. You know, we saw a massive surge in the supply of money uh, to the economy, and we've had too much money chasing too few goods, and that's giving us the rise in prices that we perceive as inflation. But the, I don't believe that's an <clears throat> infinite process. I believe the adjustment of real money is being undertaken both by central banks and their QT, combined with rising prices, eroding the value of the nominal money supply and bringing down real money. In short, all right, it's a process that has has a finite endpoint, and by our calculations at high frequency economics, we have some great charts on this for our readers. Um, we expect that most central banks will have gotten money supply back to where it ought to be for price stability within the next year, and that a year from now we will be talking about the recession and hardly talking right. at all about inflation. But we have to get there first, and we're not quite there yet. Carl, you read on the stochastic nature of inflation, you look at the two bouts after 1947, and on and on and on the pointedness of it, up we go, high inflation, we turn around and disinflate rapidly. Is that your scenario? 
I don't think we have to see disinflation, all right? We've had, again, you look at the chart of money supply in the United States, and I hate to sound like a monetarist because I'm not one, but you got to look at this chart, Tom, and you see this big bubble of money being printed, and there's just too much money out there, so we have to right. wear that. And a one-time increase in money should lead to a one-time increase in prices, and it feels like inflation when we're doing it, and that's where we are right now. Right. We're just prices, but it doesn't go on forever, all right? And uh, we don't have to see prices fall okay. from here, just though we stabilize at a higher level. Let me go, Milton Friedman, David Laidler, on you as we go monetarist. Where does that money go if we have a balloon of money? Well, first of all, the Fed takes a lot of it back with its quantitative tightening, and that's what we're starting to see now. And that's what we're going to see in Europe on Wednesday morning. We're going to see a big step toward reducing the money supply in Europe and getting it to where it should be within a year. And the other place it goes is that rising prices make the real money stock, the amount of goods and services that the money can buy, all right, get become less. So therefore, all right, we then adjust the amount of money we have to the amount of goods and services we're producing. So the money doesn't disappear, but real money gets eroded by the rising prices and the central banks do the right thing, which is what they're doing, which is start to take it out with quantitative tightening. This right sizing of monetary policy, what does that do in terms of the depth of the recession that you're predicting? Well, the recession itself, there are a number of factors behind the recession. Some of them are just cyclical, all right? Some of them, the biggest component of it, though, is that I believe that wages have not kept up with prices. That, by the way, is your clue that the inflation is not going to be self-sustaining. And we have real incomes coming down. So we have probably a pretty powerful recession coming. We also had a pretty powerful boost out of this coming out of this wonky recession that we just had. I mean, reread Jay Powell's speech at Jackson Hole, not last summer, but the summer before. He says, this is the darndest thing I've ever seen. We had a recession and incomes went up at the same time. How could that be? All right. We've got a lot of excesses that we have to purge. So I think we have a sizable correction in the economy to come. I can't put a number on it right now, but right. I think it's going to be a pretty substantial one. It's not going to be a little one. Carl, what's your theme for your 2023 outlook? Give us a window into that. I think we're going to morph our concerns away from inflation. Prices will stabilize, and then we'll be thinking more about the recession. So it's a pivot in your language, all right, a morphing of uh, focus away from inflation as prices stabilize. Mm. Carl Weinberg, thank you so much. High Frequency Economics, just a terrific brief. And even there, Lisa, we've got to have Dr. Weinberg back because we didn't even get to one of his fortes, which is the emerging market fragilities that are out there. Friday, look for it, folks. Abramo, I'll be off Friday after surviving my cooking. Uh, Bramo with Damien Sassauer. What, yeah. a, what an inspired pairing. Well, I love that I'm with Damien because you guys all ditched me to go enjoy your second day of the of the Thanksgiving uh, holiday. But Damien's going to be the trooper that comes in here. and We're going to have a great time. We're going to talk to all sorts of strategists and focus on fixed income and talk about what's going on with the shopping. Are you going to do shopping? No, no, it's England, U.S., I think, Friday. I can't remember. There's a big, big game Friday. John and I have already picked out a bar. He says I have to go below 59th Street. Yeah. So, you know, that's what we'll be <laughs> Good doing luck. Friday. Have fun. And we hear even more people <clears throat> clicking off. I do want to just point out one thing. Carl Weinberg was talking about the year ahead and what do you get if you pull out all of this uh, extra money that, that central banks pulled in. Fair amount of gloom there. So Morgan Stanley put out their outlook and talked about where they disagreed the most and where they had the most heated disagreements yes. had to do with Steve the housing Roach market. 101. And this, to me, was fascinating, that they really had a controversial moment where they think that there is going to be a massive decline in the number of sales, but there isn't going to be a huge decline in prices. This is one of the big distinguishing features. People think that there isn't going to be this massive housing route, even though you've got 7% mortgage rates. And to me, this is one of the biggest question marks because yeah. this is the first area that really feels mm -hmm. how much we've jacked up rates and what the consequences I are. I strongly based. agree with this. And first of all, in our prism here within three zip codes of New York City, we don't know what we're talking about. Let's start with that. <laughs> but the bottom line is they're dead on in that housing is a huge part of the economy, huge part of inflation, OER and all that is hugely behavioral to me. It's, a, it's, it's, it's underplayed. It's not just about statistics and cold math. And just like you say, people are going to see an X percent decline in their house, and they're going to go, let's sit on it. Well, and the, where else can yeah. they move, right? If, yeah. if, if borrowing costs are where they are, they're, like, there's going to be no yeah. inventory, which is well, what you're seeing now to some degree. Shout out to Stephen Roach, who invented modern Morgan Stanley economics, which has always been visibly fractious, and we think that is a good 
deep and powerful thing. It's like me and Bramo. We haven't agreed since 2017, I think. Stay with <laughs> us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In a newspaper interview, Germany's defense minister says the country is offering Patriot missile defense systems to Poland. Last week, a strike killed two people in a Polish village near the Ukrainian border. Germany also intends to extend a deployment of Patriot batteries in Slovakia through 2023. The UN's atomic agency says powerful blasts shook the area of Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant over the weekend. Former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers warned U.S. policymakers to focus on building the country's own economic strengths in its contest with China rather than on attacking its adversary. Summers tells Bloomberg the U.S. should instead concentrate on its own innovation, infrastructure, education and challenges such as opioid deaths. Seven national football teams, including England, will not wear a rainbow armband showing solidarity with LGBTQ rights, bowing to pressure from FIFA because players might receive a yellow card for the show of support. Qatar is under intense scrutiny leading up to the World Cup over the treatment of migrant workers, as well as concerns about human rights and its criminalization of homosexuality. And it wasn't the star the hosts were hoping for on the pitch, beaten 2 to nothing by Ecuador in the opening match. Today, the U.S. takes on Wales. And American musician Ye has returned to Twitter after a two-week hiatus from the social network. And new owner Elon Musk welcomed him back on the platform. Ye's account had been temporarily suspended and restored at the end of October, which Musk said was not his decision. Ye's earlier suspension had been due to an anti-Semitic tweet. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The single most damaging factor for the world economy uh, is the war. And if we want to return to growth, the sooner the world ends, the better. Kristalina Gorgieva of the International Monetary Fund on her war again from Eastern Europe. She viscerally understands uh, the terrain. And Lisa Abramowitz, the terrain there this weekend was finally the feeling of winter. In some of the cities with destroyed infrastructure, the Ukrainians are simply pulling out people because they cannot live in that nascent winter cold. And a real attack right now on the electric system, on the electric grid by Russia on Ukraine. How much is this really causing an escalation that's really creating a bit of discomfort and even more discomfort uh, around the world? Very good. Right now, we're going to stop the show. And we made a decision here at least 15 years ago to say, yes, we do economics, finance and investment. But far more, we do international relations, not knowing the world would be turned upside down, as we have seen in the recent decades. Providing leadership worldwide on that has been Richard Haas. He's president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Full disclosure, I'm a member. Well, I pay my dues. I think I'm behind on my dues, Richard Haas, but we'll, we'll go there another time. He is yeah, the Bitcoin payment was really yeah, the Bitcoin worked out. Richard Haas is retiring, pulling away from truly his Council on Foreign Relations. Richard Haas, thank you so much for joining us. So much to talk about today. Where must the Council on Foreign Relations go to lead as fractious international diplomacy? Well, Tom, first of all, I'm not retiring from anything. I'm departing the council after 20 years, but I'm going to stay active in the uh, public conversation, both about this country's role in the world as well as about the future of American uh, democracy. But I think it's healthy for institutions, despite what's going on right. at Disney. I think it's kind of healthy for institutions every now and then to have a change in, uh, in leadership. I think for the council, it's simply to continue to be a resource on a wide range of challenges, whether it's the revival of geopolitics or global issues. We, you know, we're just finishing up a uh, uh, the COP27 meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh, and quite honestly, right. I think it's uh, almost a complete and utter, uh, utter failure. And I also think you know, increasingly we need to look at the relationship between America internally and America externally. 
and whether we're ever going to be positioned to again lead the world, because this world is not going to organize itself to meet the challenges it faces without uh, an involved uh, and effective United States. So I think the, the inbox in this field is as full as right. it's ever been. I, I agree with that strongly. And folks, a brief here, 240 pages, is Richard Haas. The Bill of Obligations is he and we go in search of the will of America to move forward. Richard Haas, the new administration, the new Congress, the new presidency two years out, do they have the will to find their Bill of Obligations? I don't see a lot of it, Tom. I'll be honest. Uh, you know, I don't think we're off to a great start. Uh, the new Republican House of Representatives seems much more interested in politics than policy, in investigations than legislation. Uh, I think for the next two years, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for the Biden administration to get legislation passed really about anything. I think you're going to see, therefore, uh, an emphasis on foreign policy where presidents traditionally have more discretion than they do on things domestic, and probably a greater emphasis on, on, on regulation, on executive action, again, to essentially find ways to do things without requiring uh, Congress to, to, to join. In this fractious global order, how confident are you that the U.S. will remain close to Europe, at least as close to Europe as they have traditionally, based on some of the recent fa uh, fissures, not only with respect to exactly how to deal with the energy crisis, but also <clears throat> with tech investments and some of the, uh, the, the, the bills that Congress has passed so far that really focus on the U.S.? It's a good question, Lisa. I think it's a mixed record. On one hand, if this administration, the Biden administration, stands for anything, and it's an, al it's an alliance first foreign policy, and I think the entire management of the Ukraine crisis, the Russian crisis, has been, has been pretty good. You also see a growth in transatlantic trade, whether it's because of, of energy or a de-emphasis on trading with adversaries, a re-emphasis on trading with, with, uh, with friends. Where I'm worried about over the long term is not so much Russia as it is China. And I think there could be a growing split between what you might call American economic pressure on China, almost economic warfare, and Europe led by Germany looking to China in many ways to compensate for the loss of uh, economic ties with, with Russia. And if there were to ever be a crisis over Taiwan, this divergence across the Atlantic, one makes a crisis more likely because China may not fear uh, sanctions. Or if there were a, a crisis and the United States wanted to introduce sanctions, I could imagine a big transatlantic split. This is really important, especially as German Chancellor Olaf Scholz just went to China with a bunch of executives of big uh, industrial companies. How much do you give credence then to the softening in tone that we've heard, at least recently, with the U.S. and China and Tony Blinken, he Blinken heading over there early next year? Look, I think it's good. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned diplomat, so I actually happen to believe in diplomacy. I think that's progress. I thought the meeting in Bali was a, a useful exchange. I think it's useful to have follow-up, but let's not kid ourselves. These countries are on very different uh, pages. The question is whether they can set up some rules of the road about how to limit their differences over Taiwan so it doesn't lead to conflict. But I don't see any sign, for example, that China is lending a hand to deal mm -hmm. with North Korea, which is busy building up nuclear weapons and shooting off uh, missiles. I don't see that China's helping with Iran. We can go around the world. So geopolitically, the two countries are not mm -hmm. on the same page. China's still not helping with, with, with climate much. So uh, again, to me, the real question with the United States and China with these talks is whether they can avoid negatives more than achieve positives. Uh, Richard Haas, uh, I grew up with part of the House being a middle 20th century isolationist, what was called a Chicago Tribune Midwest isolationism, something I'm sure you saw west of Oberlin, Ohio. And when I look at where we are today, Richard Haas, we have a new isolationism. It's always there, but this time it's different. Color the character of America's new isolationism. Right. We're seeing it, Tom, and it doesn't respect party lines. We're seeing it in both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Uh, you see in the Republican Party a kind of flirtation with Russia, this talk about conditioning or limiting aid to Ukraine. On the progressive side of the Democratic Party, again, an impatience over money spent for foreign policy or national security abroad, wanting to see more at home. What's missing on both sides of the aisle is an appreciation of two things. One is that money spent on foreign policy is good for us here at home. We are not going to do well in a world that unravels, uh, to use my favorite word, in a world in, in, in disarray. 
Secondly, what ails us at home for the most part is not a lack of resources being spent. You look at how much we're spending domestically. That's not the problem. It's how we spend money is the issue, much more than how, how much we spend. Plus, increasingly, as you know better than anybody, uh, what's crowding out a lot of useful forms of domestic spending is not national security. It's servicing our debt. And that's something mm -hmm. if, if people on the left and the right wanted to free up money to devote to domestic causes, they could focus very much uh, on the size of America's debt. Richard Haas, thank you so much. With the Council and his Council on Foreign Relations, the new book, The Bill of Obligations, is the will out there to move forward uh, into the next decade. We're going to move forward to a data check. Futures negative uh, 22. The VIX back above 24. Monday. Thanksgiving week. It's a churn. It's an elevation. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. This economy is still the most resilient economy in the world. The rally could continue. I do think it is a bear market rally. I mean, you know, it could go to the end of the year. There are huge opportunities underneath the surface. We're still going to be facing an awful lot of volatility in, in 2023. Really what we're dealing here is potentially with an earnings decline that is not yet priced into the market for 2023. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen on a Monday on radio, on television, in one hour, England, Iran. John Farrell's not in today. I'm shocked, Lisa. I wonder why. He's I wonder assignment. why. Assignment. Yeah, not only that, but you know how he was putting up his tree ahead of Thanksgiving? Yeah. Well, guess what? So did Bloomberg. So you've got the tree and you've got the World Cup and he's off. Yeah, he well, expects. you know, he's, he's, he's killing it here on Thanksgiving week. We hope John enjoys his World Cup. We do actually do miss him uh, because of his really true knowledge of all that's going on here. Cutter Ecuador, you saw it yesterday. I saw it. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. Although right. Cutter is right. sort of sad for them because this is their, their yeah, real they, tour yeah, de force. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. is when their country really put all the money into it, and then they just couldn't really well, make it. Yeah, you know, but that's my my take is there it is, and the people committed this, like Mr. Farrell with encyclopedic knowledge, they're going to love it, and we have to sort of follow along with respect. And it's in America the next time around. You didn't say it was a massive week ahead. <clears throat> no, it's not a massive week ahead. It's you know it's Thanksgiving week, folks. We talked to Margie uh, Patel about her distressed bird. She's cooking. Future's negative twenty two. You know, I, I, I look at it. And I think it's such an odd week. It's good to have the news flow of the morning. Let's go through the two items right now. Iger back in at Disney. Were you surprised? I am not surprised given the fact that the shares have absolutely plummeted, that Disney <clears throat> Plus is losing more than a billion dollars right. a year. You're seeing this real push from activists to do something, bring back somebody who right. can really generate a culture that was successful. But this was someone who really pioneered a lot of the streaming and really tried to push right. for a lot of the streaming. What are they going to do? Off, uh, lo uh, offload ESPN? Is that what they're thinking? My doing? take on this is the Sunset Tower Hotel in Hollywood and their wonderful poolside restaurant where people like Mr. Iger hold court. This is about creative people. Mr. Chapek was not a creative person. Even he admitted that. And with all that's going on, particularly, as Paul Sweeney says, in the streaming death we're seeing right now, get Iger back creative before they find a new creative person. This is a specific industry. And yet, wholesale, Disney is not the only one that's facing some of the worst losses in their history. And they're down the most now, going back to the 1970s, or poised for the worst annual loss. How much are you going to see more of this, kind of pushing for <clears throat> activism, for, for, for changes in the C-suite? Because that's really also what's underpinning this. You have Nelson Peltz coming in there, trying to push for change. You've got other activist investors saying, yeah, it's not I, working. You need to prioritize yeah. us, and it's going to get rougher ahead. How much is this going to end up being what's going to happen at a number of different companies going forward? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. On China, let's get right to an end of Kerr, and uh, really I thought was uh, informative there in the last hour. This is for real. It's a new lockdown. Well, and this is because you're actually seeing cases spread. This is sort of the carrot and stick approach of reopening in China. They don't have the collective immunity, and you ask the good question to end a current about what about Pfizer? What about Moderna? When are they going to start importing more effective vaccines? And we don't know. 
No, oh, I mean, it was just we don't know. There's, it's all there is to it. Let's do this. We've got such a wonderful uh, guest here. Let's get to the data right away and then dash to your brief. Futures negative 22 where they've been all morning. Bonds give us no information uh, this morning. There is some economic data uh, this week. And, of course, we stagger around to that critical inflation report uh, that we see in December. And the jobs report, more important now than maybe two weeks ago. 210 spread gives me next to nothing, negative 70 uh, basis points. I think oil's important. Lisa, to have oil crack would be really important. We're not there yet. West Texas, uh, just under $80 a barrel. Yeah, but this is on potential weakness, not only <clears throat> with respect to China and potential lockdowns, but also just globally as you start to see uh, yields right. rise. By the way, <clears throat> it's countdown to meeting minutes on Wednesday, the FOMC oh, meeting you're minutes. you killing me. <laughs> they put them out on Wednesday to bury them in the Thanksgiving exit. I do want to point out, and I can't cite it, I'm so sorry, but someone who is a theme to be the takeover at the Bank of Japan made clear he wasn't thrilled about yield curve control. And yen out 1% today, two big figures, uh, 142 rounded up is a weaker yen. And I think that's important. Oh, that's But it's the radar, but it's important. We'll keep track of that throughout the day. <clears throat> also, what I'm looking at for t uh, today is Fed speak. We have one. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly is going to be speaking for almost two hours, starting at 12 p.m. Eastern. How much is she going to talk about the auctions? Because we're all focused on the five-year auction at 1 p.m. today. But we also <clears throat> want to hear from her about how long she sees the Fed keeping rates potentially above 5 percent when she starts to feel that perhaps they need to ease or pivot into a less restrictive stance. Today, Earnings include Zoom video communications after market. We were talking about Disney. How much do you start to see a complete rethink of companies that were completely bid up during the pandemic, Man. completely bid Are up in an era? Are Disney with Zoom? I don't think you can do that. There is only the similarity that they both ballooned in eras where suddenly people were rethinking sure. the whole era of work versus home, of entertainment versus external uh, experiences. So this is sort of a question mark. What do you do <clears throat> facing the new reality? And today, this is all that people really care about. The World Cup games include England versus Iran in about an hour time, Senegal versus Netherlands at 11 a.m., U.S. versus Wales at 2 p.m. I'm, gonna, Tony I, I'm gonna looking be there. forward to that. I'm I looking forward to USA Wales. I am as well, and I promise you that we will leave no it to the experts about, hey. rather than us to try to pretend. Make she it get up. David Blanchflower on tomorrow. I'm sure he'll be watching. I'm sure. Darkness. I'm sure everyone's watching instead of this and not going to be really looking for my insights in it. But nonetheless, <clears> it is going to be compelling to see yeah. some of the diplomatic kind of aspects. of Gabe, this thank you so much for watching in Hollywood in the early Hollywood morning. Gabe makes very clear that Mr. Iger wouldn't be seen in the restaurant of the Sunset Tower Hotel. He would be in the Tower Bar. That's a surveillance correction. Well, thanks, thanks, thank Tom. you, Gabe, for pointing that out uh, this morning. Right now, and if you're taking notes on the equity market, get out the pad, get out the paper, because Katie Kaminsky, chief research strategist at Alpha Simplex, is a turtle. She is a turtle trader from way back, which is trend matters. Get, uh, uh, Katie, everybody would kill for your performance this year, still up 40 percent. What is the trend forward or are trends breaking now? Yeah, Tom, it's been a phenomenal year for trend in a year where things are very uncertain. Um, what we have noticed, though, is that we're going through an inflection point right now. Like we saw earlier this summer, we're starting to see that shorter term signals and longer term signals are kind of at odds. Um, and so I think we, just like the rest of the market, are looking for a pivot to the next big trend. Uh, so far, um, you're looking at a day like today, the dollar is coming back a little bit. That may not be over. Um, and of course, short bond signals are still there in the data. Well, Katie, can you elaborate on that, this sort of pivot point that you see in terms of short term and longer term signals? What is that pivoting us to, right? We've come from an era where bonds have been all over the place, but we saw a rally recently. We saw stocks being both stocks and bonds rallying. What's the new pivot? What's that new reality? Well, the thing is, we've really, the challenge has been that we've had a mixed signal. So there's no clear signal net at this point. And that's why I say we're definitely at an inflection point. But if I had to look a little closer at what has changed the most, optimism has come into signals at a level that is consistent with what we've seen recently. So you've seen more positive signals in equities, especially around the CPI print. You're also seeing a little bit more um, reversion out of the dollar trade but that's still there. So that's why I kind of said it's a balance between what do we see shorter term and longer term. And the longer term signals are still definitely saying that there's some things to worry about ahead, especially the curve. 
uh, the yield curve being inverted recently. Katie, you've nailed it with bonds in particular. You went short bonds, which has been the widow maker for so many years. And this was one of the areas where you absolutely knocked it out of the park with nearly 40% returns so far this year. How much do you buy this conviction that we're feeling in Wall Street that that's going to be the biggest area of outperformance by 10 year, by 30 year treasuries, and you're going to just do really well next year? So we did some research this year on bonds. It was called the short of shorting bonds. And one of the things that we need to think about if we're moving into a much more uh, focused on rising rates and higher rates environment is that bonds are not going to behave under inflationary pressures like they did in the past. And this year was just the first data point to show us that that's the case. And I think what has been the most fascinating to me is how we avoid thinking about long bias. And so many of us are so dependent on being long bonds we forgot what it's like to actually think about how do you deal with actually shorting bonds and how do you deal with bonds and valuation versus inflation? And I think that is going to be the key question for all investors right. in the next uh, few years. What's great about trend following folks, and this is rumored folks, Liverpool may be up for sale. John Henry, owner of the Red Sox, arch turtle trader. Rumor has it Henry may sell Liverpool to Kaminsky. We'll have to see on that as well. We get a lot of emails, Katie, when you're, when you're on with us. Are moving averages helpful to trend followers? Yes, I mean, I think the way we think about it, moving averages give you one way to measure the strength of a trend. These days, we use a wide range of different methods. Some of it is based on machine learning. Some of it is based on different types of breakout signals. But the point is, in environments where the world is very uncertain, you have to turn to what the market is doing as opposed to what it should do. Because frankly, few people actually know what it should do these days because it's so volatile and unclear what the future is actually going to hold under this inflationary environment. Katie, thank you so much. Katie Kaminsky, arguably the number one performance of surveillance guests this year at Alpha Simplex is, well, it's yeah. just stunning to me to see, Lisa, how trend following versus gaming, catching a knife in the dark, how trend following, there's some years where it just clicks in with a vengeance, and this was one of them. Turtles? Turtles. This goes back to the 70s, I think. Um, two guys wrote a book or a paper even, and they called it turtle trading because of the patience required. And it started out pretty much with CTAs and the C is for commodities, because as a general rule, commodities trend more than the other asset classes. You climb on cocoa and you stay on cocoa. I'm you just climb so on glad. Tang futures. <laughs> and you just stay on Tang you futures tang, forever uh, more. I, I, That's I, what we do. Put the kids through yeah. school. <laughs> on Tang futures. <laughs> Thanks. Stay with us. Futures at negative 23, Dow futures at negative 89. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Chinese stocks in the Yuan retreated as a string of reported COVID deaths and tighter restrictions in some districts gave investors a rude reminder the path to any reopening will be rough. A city near Beijing that was rumored to be a test case for removing virus restrictions across China has asked residents to stay at home for five days. A potential sign officials are reverting to tighter COVID zero curbs. Meanwhile, the country's first COVID-related death in almost six months has sparked concern that Beijing could see a return of restrictions. The U.S. and Chinese defense chiefs are likely to meet for their first talk since Beijing suspended dialogue with Washington over House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's August visit to Taiwan. A Pentagon spokesman says U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin would welcome a meeting with Chinese Defense Minister Wei Feng Ye. Now, it's the latest sign that ties between the two nations are stabilizing. The COP talks in Egypt have ended with an agreement to help developing nations face the devastation of climate change. Although the deal for a loss and damage fund paid for by rich countries is seen as a breakthrough, negotiators failed to agree further cuts in CO2 emissions. Equity investors hoping for a better year in 2023 will be disappointed, according to strategists at Goldman Sachs Group, who say the bear market phase is not over yet. Strategists including Peter Oppenheimer and Sharon Bell predict markets will reach a final trough next year before a strong rebound. 
Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Is more work to be done. I expect that this will require additional increases in the federal funds rate, followed by a period of holding rates at a sufficiently restrictive level for some time. Susan Collins of Boston managing the message forward for the Fed. Mary Daly uh, is a lonely speaker today, I believe. Lisa, Mary Daly is important. Susan Collins is important. Is everybody from the Fed speak you follow? Is everybody on the same page? I think so at this point. There is a feeling that you need to get restrictive, that inflation is the first and the foremost concern. Leah Brainerd, perhaps, has been vice the chairman. most, the vice chair has been perhaps the, the most reluctant to go all in in terms of how far the Fed has to go, in terms of how long right. they have to stay there. But it's pretty unanimous. Inflation is the number one concern, period, full stop. Dr. Brainerd, having a cumulative Thanksgiving, it will be the accumulation of cooked onions, mashed potatoes, Cream. squash. Creamed onions, yes. Yeah, yeah. The cranberry sauce. How do you do Cumulative. potatoes? How do I do potatoes? <laughs> Someone else does them for me. Thank you. <laughs> Mashed potatoes. Oh, okay. Uh, but but you know I can go either way there. I mean it's it's good. Anyways, there's the Fed speak uh, today. <laughs> we won't ask Mary Daly today uh, what she's going to cook for Thanksgiving. I mean, Alex Maybe. Webb doesn't celebrate Thanksgiving. He's in London and joins us now with Bloomberg uh, Quick Take. And here on the many happy thoughts. As Peter Pan said to Wendy, John, and I think it was Alex as well, and Peter Pan, think happy thoughts. Alex, to begin, there are not happy thoughts today at Disney. There is repair. What does Mr. Iger have to repair? Yeah, I mean, I think that what had happened during lockdown, and not to belabor the analogy too much, but there was a second start of the right carry on till morning. Well, morning has arrived. And actually, what they were trying to do during the lockdowns was under pressure from activists and investors. Right. They pivoted basically towards being a growth stock. They cut the dividend. They invested that in Disney Plus, in content for Disney Plus, with the hope that they would get close to the 50 plus price to forward earnings multiple that Netflix was enjoying at the time. And that worked. It worked during the lockdowns. Of course, what we've now seen is that there's a, with rising interest rates, we've seen a, a flight away from, from growth stocks. Um, and we've seen, therefore, Netflix shares come down, of course, right. exacerbated by its stagnating user growth. And Disney shares come down as well. Disney has reinstated the dividend, but it's still far lower than it was three, four years ago. So the question for Bob Iger is, like, do you take more capital away from Disney Plus? And do you um, then try to return some of that capital to investors because, you know, returns right. are now what people, sort of more immediate returns are what investors are looking for. Alex, that's the financial here. I'm very fascinated by the creative side of which Mr. Iger excels. Is he simply a caretaker as they go out and find a new creative CEO? Well, he clearly is a caretaker in the sense that he's been given a two-year contract, and it's hard, given his age, to imagine that it would be extended much beyond that, even though we saw his contract extended time and again um, you know, before he ultimately hands it over to Bob Chapek. Look, his approach to Disney was trying to stabilize earnings by investing in franchises. We saw that with Pixar. We saw that with uh, um, Marvel. And, and we saw that with Star Wars. It was with, you know, with Lucasfilm, where they built these franchises where you could pretty much be guaranteed you'd be getting an audience for their films. That helps stabilize revenue over a relatively long period. Now, the calculation is a little bit different as we look at the streaming world, where you need to have so much more content. It's not just tent poles. You need a regular cadence. That is very capital intensive. And now the market is questioning whether that capital intensity is ever really likely to reward you with <coughs> stable revenue. How much is this a Disney story, Alex? And how much is this a broader story about right-sizing a company that really expanded during an era of free money and then a pandemic distortion around entertainment. I think you're right that there is a broader piece here that lots of other companies, particularly as we say, these kind of in inverted commas growth stocks have had to do a little bit of correction. There is a lot of Disney specific stuff because there is an element with Bob Chapek that yes, maybe he mismanaged some of the, the capital market stuff, 
but there is also internal culture stuff, some of his engagement with politicians, not least in Florida, which um, were not taken particularly well by the employees. If you've lost the investment community to an extent and you've lost um, your employees, again, to an extent, then you can see why the board might sit there and go, well, actually, is this the right man for the job? Who buys ESPN? Well, ESPN is a cash cow for Disney, right? It doesn't really make sense for them to want to get rid of it. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who would like to buy it. The signals we've seen pretty much without fail have been that Disney does not want to sell it. And you can see why. Think about it in terms of the New York Times. The New York Times might be pivoting towards digital, but for much of the past five years, it's still made very good money from ads in its print business. So Disney has a similar approach. Yes, it, you might think that cable is a dying business or is in slow, long-term decline, but it still remains highly profitable and generates a huge amount of cash. Alex Webb, thank you so much. Got to go. See you on the second star on the right. Alex Webb there uh, with our Peter Pan theology in London. And it's the only place you can do Peter Pan. I mean, you know, I mean, how many times have you seen Hook, which was not on Disney? I mean, Hook was on TriStar, but, you how know, Dustin time? Hoffman, Robin Williams, how many times have you seen Hook? How many, how many times have you really watched Disney Plus? Does, I do. I just finished all of Andrew. I actually liked it. It was actually almost successful. Well, I wonder how much they can cater to adults because they're That's known the, as dead being on. the the really the, Other the, than that, the key no. yeah. babysitter for children. And now where they have to sort of readjust, especially <clears throat> with Hulu. Well, there's some enthusiasm out there. I know Doug Cass looking at Disney this morning and finding it attractive. I believe it's his third largest holding. And Jason Bazinet over at Citigroup reaffirms here, uh, Lisa, 92 up to where I think it right now it's roughly 99. 9.73 and his price target 145. He says, Iger, there's going to be some theology here. Like, what does Disney do with sports betting? Well, and the yeah. answer is Iger's not so sure they want to do that. Well, this is a culture question. I do just I look agree. at the pan at the shares. They're down 41 <clears throat> percent year to date. Everything else is too. Well, okay, but this is the In question. In de defense. But but this is the question. When do we bottom? Right. And that's really the issue. People are seeing this as an opportunity. OK, well, now it's sort of reset in terms of the pricing. So when do we see the bottom? And that's the catharsis that we've been looking for that people are really talking about. Paul Sweeney is on the same page as Michael Nathan and Nathanson and Richard Greenfield. It's to show me a sustained profit model of streaming. And I just don't think it's there. And when I, I just I don't see it. And what about bundling? Right. Who's going to be the bundler? Who's going to be <clears> someone who takes this and really offers it in a way that is comprehensive, that is organized, that is going to give people some sort of uh, price uh, realism? Because honestly, when you start to put them all together, it starts to be more than cable. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I just I look at it like this weekend I was watching this Bombay thing. On Apple TV, it's an Indian thing. They're in Bombay. Some Australian guy goes up to Bombay, and he's got to hide out in the slums and and all that. Well, how do they make money at that? I don't. I mean, the actors are clearly overpaid. There's no question about it. But how do they make money at that? I'm struggling to know where to go with this. A Bombay thing, and there are people going around. And how do they make money? Look, I think that your point I, I is well taken. That they travel, they that they're okay big there? budget, that they're big, you know, productions. And then how do they generate the enthusiasm when it's all over the place in disparate places? But Netflix has turned it around more than people had expected. Can Disney do the same? I, I don't know. We'll talk to the experts on this. Fascinating to see Mr. Iger back at Disney. Futures, you know, the tape's not giving me much love uh, today. Japanese yen, 142. Weaker yen, that's important. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Surveillance. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Kane. John Farrow off on assignment. England, Iran here in 30 uh, minutes as well. And I need to say thank you to all of you out in the zeitgeist who have been very supportive of how we address Bitcoin. Lisa, I'll be honest. In, in hindsight, it's easy. But if none of this blow up had happened, I, I still would say it. We've killed ourselves trying to be balanced on this. And to try to not buy into yeah. the incredible enthusiasm at a time when a lot of people didn't understand it, but we're still investing in it. <clears throat> yeah. 
Well, we'll have to see. What we're going to do here is talk to two experts on uh, Bitcoin. But first, we've got to look at a non-mover market with futures negative 20. What do you do? Start with Disney and yeah, stay on basically, Disney? Basically, we're just going to do real quick. <laughs> Disney shares up after people looking at what's going to happen with perhaps a new leadership. I'm looking right now at a pop of 8.5%. I'm right. also looking at some losers, uh, Las Vegas Sands and Wind Resorts. And this really is on the prospect of perhaps renewed shutdowns in China. And it really shows how much you know the entire entertainment payment business hinges to some degree on what happens there in China. That's it. I'm not going to like sit on this because this is yeah, a market I, that I stasis should, should ahead of the bird. Point. Yeah, that's what we're going to do here. You'll see it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Rumor has it Bramo and Thursday uh, is well. <laughs> John just, and I really? will be on our way to Doha. Thanks. I yeah. appreciate it. Anytime. With Damien Sassar. That's cool. That is that's cool. Gonna we're going to have a great very, time. Very, uh, cool. Bitcoin. I'm going to start with Katie Greifeld. Of course, she has been outstanding in giving us coverage. Uh, Katie, if I was teaching a lecture on point and figure charting, Bitcoin from 61,000 down to 16,000 is one of the ugliest charts I've ever seen. Today, we dip under 16,000 to 15,000. Does anybody care about that price action? I would say so. Again, that $16,000 level, for better or worse, it's really held. We did get about 20 a was where we were going to help. Well, you know, we're talking about round-ish numbers, round -ish. even numbers. Uh, you say the chart is ugly. I think in a way it's kind of beautiful. I mean, if you look at it over <laughs> one year, you get these plateaus. These drops, plateaus, okay. drops, which, I mean, you don't really see that in other assets. So in this beautiful chart that you're looking at, why have we not seen a bigger drop if $3 billion were wiped out for creditors with FTX? And we don't and know the who they are. And we don't know who they are, yeah. and we don't have a sense of what the ripple effects will be. Well, for to they? start, it's it's a market that's, <laughs> that's controlled so creepy. by a lot of whales. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, for example, that alone, it's a $10 billion the trust. The Grayscale Bitcoin Trust? Grayscale. You oh, excuse a me. Lot, a lot <laughs> of you tell us. Yeah, can you imagine if I revealed myself? But mm. in any case, that controls 3.3% of the outstanding supply of Bitcoin. You have a lot of large holders such as that. And at this point, too, the fact that we're at $16,000 from $69,000, a lot of the sellers who would be selling, the marginal seller, they're gone. They've already been flushed out. Now you're left with the true believers who... Losses okay, who, aren't really seriously, who are sell. they? I mean, is a judge going to come out and say you have to show who they are? I mean, what's our reporting on this? Well, there's a difference between someone who is now a creditor at FTX, a customer who lost money, and people who keep their Bitcoin, for example, in cold storage <laughs> off these sort of hot wallets who have them really stored on the blockchain. What does cold storage mean, Tom? It means, it means that Jenny, cold storage is when you're on Kuka Lake ice fishing and you put the case of Jenny cream in the ice. Uh -huh. Specifically to Bitcoin, it means that you don't storage. actually hold your Bitcoin uh, at an exchange. You don't trust these centralized exchanges and you don't okay. want to be a bag holder. Katie Grenfell, <laughs> thank you so much. No, but it's honestly, this is a really interesting question and people have been asking this, Tom, for a long time or at least for the past couple of weeks. Why have we not seen more fallout, especially in such a jittery market. Peter Shear has been writing a lot about that. Uh, head of macro strategy at Academy <laughs> Securities. And we're so glad you're actually in studio with us, which is fabulous. It is wonderful to have you on this pre-Thanksgiving uh, week. Peter, how much are you seeing uh, some sort of, I don't know, whales? And how much are you seeing something where it's a realistic pricing action of institutions having fully adopted uh, a crypto asset, even if it does lose favor to some degree? I think we have one more big leg down in crypto. I think we're going to see some selling off in Bitcoin. I think one of the things that supported it recently are the fact that there are a lot of whales who have invested interest in keeping it higher. And there's all this talk about Bitcoin maximalist, right? So there is a theory that, okay, FTT, the tokens, that was where a lot of the trouble was. Maybe Bitcoin's the quote unquote safe part of crypto. I think that narrative is going to get hurt a little bit. Um, and all the stuff that's been going on with the grayscale trust, so GBTC has been feeding into that a little bit. So people, I believe, have been selling that to buy Bitcoin. I think that's going to turn out to be a mistake as well. Why isn't this a broader market story? How can this be so contained, given that this story really grew up in the era of uh, free money? <sighs> so I think earlier this year, <laughs> it's a great question, but I think earlier this year, <laughs> the they were kind of tied together because you had a lot of people who were invested in crypto. They were invested in disruptive stocks. They all were doing it on margin. So every time one sneezed, it would you know drag down everything else. That got shaken out a little bit. So we're <clears throat> better off right now. I think the next leg of this is going to be, wow, what happens to the economy? You start looking at the amount of money that was being spent by even FTX on advertising 
crypto as a whole, right? I, I think this is going to feed into the economy. I think the wealth effect is real, right? This time we've lost $3 trillion dollars down to just under a trillion, right? There's been huge wealth effects. I think this is going to bleed into the economy. Generally, that's going to be bad. I think it's going to turn out to be good for energy usage, though. Peter, thanks so much for coming in. You have an August firm, hugely conservative at Academy of Securities, of former admirals and, and the like as well. They hang on every bit of when Cheer publishes on rates, risk, and Taylor Swift. How'd that sell? <laughs> You know, we got to do some clickbait too, even in our, our okay. business. Well, why do we sell Bitcoin to a conservative shop like Academy? These people are going to say it's unregulated, it can't be regulated, it's foreign. How do you sell Bitcoin as a legit thing to a bunch of conservative people at Academy? So fortunately, I've been fairly negative on it, but I think we're having these conversations. Where do we step in? When does it get interesting for our firm to explore it? It's really going to come down to regulation. Do the regulators come out and create an environment that you can feel comfortable with, right? And right now, it's just not there. One of my big takeaways has been for the last year, talk something as simple as where is something domiciled and where are there? Exactly. Theirs, okay, you were right. You and I are on the same page <laughs> on this. Alibaba's hanging out at the Cayman Islands uh, trying to play by a different uh, rule book. I'm going to defend Gary Gensler here right now. What does he regulate? Where's the domicile? I think that's really the key issue, right? You've got to have some sort of domicile here. And the big question I think a lot of people are talking about, even whether it's these grayscale trusts, is where is the Bitcoin? So we talk about spot ETFs, blah, 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 right? It's like, how do you confirm on a daily basis that what you think you hold in the crypto world is legitimately there without maybe publishing it and exposing yourself to theft or hacking. So I think that's really the key is most other assets, you understand whether you own it, whether it's an equity, whether it's gold, you can pretty easily prove it. That's been the hard part with crypto. I think that's what's going to have to get to the heart of regulation is how do we verify this? How do we get comfortable that we are auditing something and regulating something that's actually there? Neil Kashkari has been talking about how this is just a Ponzi scheme. He doesn't really uh, think that there's any there there here. And he's been t very vocal about that on Twitter and in lectures. How much is the banking industry leveraged to the Bitcoin and, and, and frankly, to the crypto story, not necessarily by borrowing money to invest in crypto, but in building up teams of people designed to trade it, designed to invest in? I don't think the banks have really put that much effort into it. I think they're building out, but it's a small part of their business. The other part of this, I do think people made a mistake, is every time some bank announced they were doing something on crypto, everyone read, oh, this is great, they're adopting it, they're adopting it. No, no, banks are very smart, right? If there's a bid offer to be made, if there's some trading revenue to be made, they're going to get involved. That's not a commitment to it. So I think banks can pull back if this doesn't work out. And to me, Bitcoin is always about adoption, the rate of adoption. When you want to get bullish on it, you see adoption coming up. I just don't see it going up anytime soon. In fact, I see it dropping as more and more people question why they want to be in this space. What's your call for 2023? Let's get out front of your uh, year ahead report. Uh, you get well, Taylor Swift into it? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that. I think crypto going down will be sub 10,000 on Bitcoin. You're I, calling sub 10,000 on Bitcoin? Definitely. I think that actually potentially happens even this year. I like rates, though. I think yields are actually probably the easiest trade. I want to be long yields right now. I think treasuries are going to rally. I think the economy is rolling over. The data is rolling over. And as hawkish as the Fed wants to talk, the markets are starting not to listen to it. So I love owning bonds here. Well, but we were talking to Carl Weinberg earlier, and he says quantitative tightening. What about quantitative tightening. So to me, quantitative tightening is a little bit the opposite of quantitative easing, in fact, almost exact opposite. And I find quantitative easing easier to explain. It's like if you have these Newton cradle, right, where you drop this one ball and stuff shoots out at the end. So that's what happened. It shoots out and where it really exposes itself at the riskiest end of the spectrum, right? So every single person winds up having to make a choice. I have to either buy longer duration assets, riskier assets, less liquid assets, and it really comes out at the far end. That's why I think crypto did so well, all these disruptive stocks. So when it comes back in, it's not going to express itself in yields. It's going to be in the riskiest assets. So I think stocks can still lag from here, and it's not going to express itself regardless of what we're doing on the quantitative tightening in the bond market. Bonds price up, yield down, stocks don't play. No, I think not. I think maybe we get a little surge in stocks um, after we get through this crypto debacle where people get back to comfortable, oh, lower yields is good for stocks. Then I think the reality is going to be, no, no, yields are going lower because the economy has rolled over. We've done too much. We have these right. problems. And quantitative tightening, I think, is more impactful on equities yeah. and risk assets than bonds. I mean, Evermore came out. Taylor Swift with Jack Atenoff in The National. I mean, what they did, Peter, during the pandemic, she just said, I'm not, I'm not laying low for the pandemic. And they just created and created and created. Look at the payoff. No, it's been phenomenal. I think one question that's been coming up directly to our business is, what does this do for M&A activity, right? We've already had 
D.C. that doesn't like M&A activity. And now all of a sudden you've got Live Nation, these companies, you know, getting reported on. I, I think it's going to be interesting, and I think that's going to be a headwind for uh, M&A next year. Were you Don't really be... prepared to talk about Taylor Swift? Is that really what we're doing here? Yeah. I wasn't that prepared, but I figured, you know, I think Tom, the, you got to be ready for anything. I think the influence of the That's national true. on what she did here acoustically was stunning. Well, I mean, I mean, Antonov's my hero, mm-hmm. but, you know. I'm not an expert in Taylor Swift. I will say that the controversy over uh, some of the ticket sales is going to be something that... Her song, Illicit watch. Affairs, moment I heard it, boom. Are you a, Timeless. Are you a Taylor Swift fan? No, I'm not, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Peter <laughs> Cheer, <laughs> thank you so much with Academy uh, Securities. Futures, Lisa, do the data. You can do the data check better oh, than thanks. me here. All right. It's like, it's, you know, yeah, Turkish there's nothing Lira, happening. Turkish Lira, 18.63. <laughs> Tom's like, please tell a story because there's tell nothing happening. There's, um, well, the Nasdaq is yeah. down eight tenths of a percent, and that's interesting. The yen is fascinating. Dollar stronger, yen weaker today. That's a backstory for this holiday lengthened work week. Please stay with us again. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Indonesia, at least 46 people are dead and about 700 others injured after a 5.6 magnitude earthquake shook the western Java region today. Several homes, stores and public buildings are damaged and landslides are reported following the roughly seven second earthquake. Tremors were felt in nearby cities, including the capital, Jakarta. In a newspaper interview, Germany's defense minister says the country is offering Patriot missile defense systems to Poland. Last week, a strike killed two people in a Polish village near the Ukrainian border. Germany also intends to extend a deployment of Patriot batteries in Slovakia through 2023. The UN's atomic agency says powerful blasts shook the area of Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant over the weekend. Former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers warned U.S. policymakers to focus on building the country's own economic strengths in its contest with China rather than on attacking its adversary. We in the United States probably need to be careful about our evangelizing influence. I don't think it's really for us to tell China how they should organize their entire society. Summers also cautioned about Washington becoming too aggressive with regard to strengthening ties with Taiwan, which Beijing regards as part of its territory. And Twitter's head of France announced his departure. Damien Vell led the region for about seven years. A number of workers at the Paris office, which had fewer than 50 employees before billionaire Elon Musk took over last month, are focused on advertiser relationships. Musk is considering additional layoffs and has already slashed Twitter's workforce in half. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I still think the question about is inflation peaked misplaced? Yeah, it probably has. The better question is, is it going to 2% or is it going to stop at 4? Because if it stops at 4, then the Fed has not been too too aggressive. I'm in the camp it's going to stop somewhere around 4 or 3.5, and, and that's the real problem. Not that we've peaked, but that we're not on our way back to 2%. Jim Bianco there driving the conversation forward, and it's a huge debate about whether the Fed, with their interest rates, what's the consensus right now, Lisa? I don't, I don't really think I have one. The only consensus consensus light is that long duration bonds just as peter Shea was saying are going to perform well next year uh, that yes, seems to be a yes. feeling and that stocks well, are kind of going to meander and that seems to be also another feeling and that we're going to see peak dollar there are some consensuses forming i'm also seeing a lot of calls that china is going to outperform just based on how much pain has already been absorbed into <clears> certain valuations so those are some of the uh themes that i keep hearing moving the schedule around because of the world cup uh lisa brown what's in tom king jonathan farrow is waiting for england iran here in 12 minutes and lisa friday when you're with Damien Sassauer, I didn't have the time up yet. Pharaoh hadn't sent me the time, but 2 p.m. Wall Street time, England, USA, and John has selected 
a bar to go have the, <laughs> the beverage of our choice in as Big well. Big game. I was laughing because I'm thinking, you know, yeah. that Tom Keene and Lisa Bromwitz are going to lead the uh, football coverage throughout, which really uh, is, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much says it all that side. I think Mike's helicopter almost crashed. He was so <laughs> upset by that. Saving us in Doha, Simone Foxman joins us right now outside the stadium, 30 miles north or so of Doha the other day. But today, within the skyscrapers of Doha, in our studio is well. Simone, let me give you an open question after what we saw yesterday. How's it going for this global event? Well, in the stadium, in Al Bait Stadium yesterday, I think it went pretty well. Yeah, there were some growing pains. There was a lot of traffic from the cars getting there. That was one of the few stadiums not connected to the metro system, but it was a pretty impressive opening <clears throat> ceremony. Less impressive game, uh, Ecuador easily uh, defeating yeah. Qatar 2-0, but also impressive in the stands. We had the leaders of uh, Turkey, of Egypt, and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Very closely chatting with Gianni Infantino, I might add. Well, it's going to be interesting today, and I really go forward to tomorrow. Denmark, Tunisia, I think, is a game I'm speaking. I mean, Farrell, I took notes when Farrell called me uh, today. France, Australia, maybe that's interesting. Where's the tension today in this first day where we really get started? It's all about England, Iran, and that kicks off in really? oh, just 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, it does. It does. 4 p.m. local time. There are fans making their way into the stadium right now. But there is a lot of political drama uh, on the pitch, off the pitch. Uh, for one, we saw just a couple hours ago, FIFA tell teams that uh, captains could not wear rainbow-colored armbands. This was something that Harry Kane of England in particular, but also some other teams really wanted to do in support of LGBTQ rights, but now FIFA threatening sporting sanctions, the team's telling them don't do that. But also remember, massive demonstrations going on in Iran. We are very closely watching to see how the team reacts because the team has traditionally been this hotbed of regime uh, unity. Uh, but now a lot of Iranian fans say they don't want to celebrate given all the tragedy that they see just across the Persian Gulf. Simone, what does this do for FIFA? Why is FIFA so insistent on cracking down on wearing armbands that support LGBTQ rights? You know, they are really, they've been really supportive of Qatar the whole way through recently. Um, we heard a pretty strong speech by FIFA President Gianni Infantino, essentially calling out Western criticism for being racist. He said he felt discriminated against as a guy with red hair and freckles living in a foreign country and compared that to the experience of gays, Africans and the like. It was a little bit bizarre, but you know, I think they really want to stand behind Qatar. They've invested so much in this experience. They don't want the country to kind of continue to face this. They are trying to encourage players to play football on the field and not, you know, follow the recommendations of activists who are saying, hey, players, <clears throat> hey, teams, right. bring attention to these issues while you're there. I've never been to Doha. Simone, is it? Is it bustling? I mean, what's the, um, I mean, is it like that walkway up towards the Tots Stadium where it's really bustling and all that? Is it bustling or is it just so big that it's not bustling? You know, Qatar Doha is a pretty small place, but what surprised me is it hasn't been bustling. I was out at the, some of the fan zones, the fan areas yesterday, and there just were not a ton of people milling around. Um, I'm going to go out there in just an hour or so and take a look once again. But you know, Qatar's worked really hard to try and limit the number of people who can come into the country. Right now, you can only come in if you're a ticket holder, if you're a registered guest of a ticket holder. Um, and that, that to prevent uh, too much pressure on some of the infrastructure, but wouldn't it be a terrible thing if, you know, by preventing so many people yeah. from coming, you ended up with, you know, not a fun little cup. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, certainly was an issue at the end of the Ecuador uh, versus Qatar uh, game. I am wondering whether we're going to see uh, Messi and Ronaldo face off. This has been one of the big questions, Argentina versus Portugal. The one thing that I do know is the legacy of these two superstars is going to be determined at this World Cup. What's the latest in terms of what the likelihood is that they'll get that Channeling matchup? your inner John Farrell. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm not the best sports better and my bracket is probably uh, in, entirely wrong, but certainly there are a lot of fans, uh, particularly from Argentina. I've seen a lot of Argentinian fans. Uh, I've seen a lot of Brazilian fans. I've seen a handful of Portuguese fans in town. Right. Uh, certainly the Ecuadorian fans were out in full force last night. Simone, thank you so much. In Doha through December 18th and, of course, the World Cup. Uh, we'll have coverage on that for you as we can, particularly led by, uh, I should say, John Farrell. Surveillance correction. It's good to do a correction oh, we've done a on a slow Monday. <laughs> Jim emails in and says, it's Tom, you stupid idiot. You remember the turtle book. We're talking to Katie Kaminsky. Yeah. And I said there was a turtle book, like everybody read it. And Jim says, wait, Richard Dennis did this years ago. And I, I remember this now. Thank you, uh, uh, Jim, for mentioning this. It was a course, I think, in New York. It was a course. You went to Richard Dennis's trend following technical trading course which became known as turtle trading all i know is 23 that original people when you opened it and you said here comes a turtle i was like oh please don't hang up on us please don't hang up on us no. when you call her a turtle uh and yet that mm -hmm. has been a point of pride for her this year oh, because yeah. she has done absolutely phenomenally well. And you pointed out something really interesting, Tom. You said that this traditionally is to not lose as much money or to absolutely. just do uh, consistently well. And this year, it has been a blowout, bang-up year. And how much can that continue? And how much is that really just a, a, a sort of uh, highlights right. the moment that we're in right I'll, now? I'll defer to the pros on this, including Ms. Kaminsky. But to me, so much of trend following is not about making money. It's about avoiding losing money. It's uh, it's a little bit different than the way so much of the media uh, portrays it. My you know my, my long Bitcoin at forty thousand that was turtle trading. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was really... the uh, long Austrian bond. Austrian uh, oh no, bond. we that still have also... the Austrian. We're going to be buried with the Austrian some, bond. <laughs> some They're serious turtling right over there. Oh, God. David Riley, chief investment strategist at Blue Bay Asset, on your next bond purchase. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. This economy is still the most resilient economy in the world. The rally could continue. I do think it is a bear market rally. I mean, you know, it could go to the end of the year. There are huge opportunities underneath the surface. We're still going to be facing an awful lot of volatility in, in 2023. Really what we're dealing here is potentially with an earnings decline that is not yet priced into the market for 2023. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is not a big week. Not at all. It is Thanksgiving weekend. Yet it is. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Lisa Abramowitz, and Jonathan Farrow. Jonathan Farrow off on a well-deserved day off. We are looking at a day ahead of this uh, holiday-shortened week where there is a great reset. And right now, Tom, that is what I'm focused on. All of the year-ahead outlooks that yes. speak of a new 2023 of a very <clears throat> different contract. Trying to get those slipped out. Now, some of them weighed in. To be fair to all the wonderful guests we have, they have to not front run what their clients would see. There's some serious regulations over that, but we can see them here and there. Tony Dwyer, who's been hardcore 5, 10, 15 years linking recession to equity downturns, he calls recession. Kitty Kaminsky on earlier has been up almost 40% year to date, as you put really well, Tom, that she basically has been probably the best performing surveillance guest that we've had on regularly. How much has she been seeing a pivot, a new dynamic in the trend following space where suddenly the long-term and the short-term indicators are not sending some sort of consistent message. How much is that reflected in the outlooks, in the angst that we're feeling from Wall Street right now? Well, as you mentioned in the last hour, I think we can say the call now into all of a sudden the jobs report important in December, the inflation report getting us to December 14th, and the Fed meeting is there seems to be a new call bonds price up yield down by bonds that's been basically one yeah. consensus out there a little bit of pushback around the edges and the corporate side of things we have been talking about disney all morning and i keep going back to this question of is this a disney story or is this a broader okay now what story now that we're past the pandemic yeah. and now that money costs something should we go to the news here today alex webb i thought was brilliant quoting peter pan Second star in the right here. Disney, I mean, come on. This is a you big deal to uh, uh, today. Chapek out. Some people are not surprised. I'll be honest. I'm one of them. You know, I wouldn't like overtly say that on air. Nobody cares what my opinion is. But Mr. Iger 
returns. But how much is this really the comeback of activist shareholders? And I ask this because, Dave, uh, said you're yes. seeing that. You know, you're seeing yeah. uh, Peltz come in with Tryon taking a significant stake. Well, how much are you, you. going to see some others do the same thing at <clears throat> as companies face off with this sort of painful, do we have to cut jobs, kind of like tech, or can we hold on to people? Where do you prioritize just keeping this staff at a time when you saw the, the real pains right. of losing people and not being able to rehire? No, the store today, China. I mean, there it is again, you know. You know, are they going to be able to reopen? Shut down. Yeah, and this is the reason why you're seeing certain uh, stocks kind of fall mm -hmm. off in the hope of reopening China. I don't know. Right now, I'm seeing the biggest takeaway from the resets, the sort of look ahead is that we're going to see more pain. And that's been basically Morgan Stanley. That's been Goldman Sachs out today with their outlook, basically saying that they see uh, sort of meandering stock mm. performance to the same place that we're at next year. Bramble gloom. It's, it's not there. Bramble gloom. It's Goldman Sachs gloom. It's is Morgan it, Stanley gloom. We, it's Wall Street gloom. Should we do a data check today? Let's do I it. Mean, let, you know, I mean, you can start. I mean, there it is. <laughs> it's down. All right. I'm looking right now at a NASDAQ lower by about eight tenths of a percent. Uh, you could see uh, the S&P down a little bit less than that. You could see, you know, not a lot of movement in terms of directionality. You could see a bit of dollar strength after a whole host of dollar weakness. 102.37 on the euro dollar. The 10 year is interesting to me. 3.825%. Remember, we were talking about a 5% yield when we next would see that uh, way off. And you've pointed this yes. out the oil price. What we've seen there is interesting as well. Just are we going to slip yeah. further given WTI below $80 a barrel, $79.59? That wasn't the data check I was talking about. It's a raging debate, uh, and this is out on the internet as well as at the Keen House. Do you cook turkey at 350 or at 425? It's a serious issue. I think you do both. Like, you cook them hot first, bring it down, do the slow roast, and then bring it up at the end. But that would just be one theory. What do you think? I think that you're not cooking this year, and I think you should do a Twitter poll. <laughs> I think that that's Nixon the issue. Nixon was president <laughs> when I last cooked. <laughs> well, I think that turkey, okay, unpopular opinion, <clears throat> yeah. nobody ever really likes turkey. It's sort of always too much is left over, right. and you end up, it's always dry. I'm just saying. Before we get to David Riley, uh, Lisa, this is important. Thank Hate you mail. to the Telegraph here uh, in London. Of course, it's England and Iran. It's starting right now. We'll bring you that as well. Farrell's there. He's got a cell phone out so he can tell us what's going on. But very seriously, on the sidelines, Alex Scott of the BBC is wearing one of these armbands. Interesting. Interesting. And the, the media, they're sitting on the sidelines with their BBC sport microphones warbling gaily about the game and about the football, but they're wearing the armband the players can't wear. I don't know where that goes, but that's part of the social aspect of this World Cup. Yeah, I wonder where that's going to go in terms of FIFA and just how much pushback there comes uh, against FIFA. Right now, we're going to turn to some of the uh, focus on the year ahead. One of the biggest consensus calls, go long bonds. David Riley, Chief Investment Strategist at Blue Bay Asset Management, here to weigh in. Is this your number one as well? 10-year, 30-year, the longer the better. Um, yeah, I do think it's going to be a year when duration um, actually, you know, pays off and it will make sense to be long duration. I'm actually more inclined to go in terms of the uh, Treasury curve towards the five year um, point. And, and that's because um, I do think that it's more likely than not that the US economy goes into um, recession. I think we'll probably therefore get some bull steepening in the um, curve. Uh, normally, you'd express that at the, at the very short end, but we don't really know how far and how fast inflation will fall. And therefore, we don't really know at what point does the Fed start considering um, rate cuts. So I think the five year is probably quite a good sort of sweet uh, spot. And with that, I'd also be uh, buying some high grade uh, credit at this uh, level as well. See, Tom, he likes the five year auction. That's what he was just saying right there. He's That's saying good. he likes That's the five year. That's the only reason we book him is for auction love with <laughs> exactly. Lisa Bramowitz. Well, thank you, David. I do wonder, though, at what point you're looking at a return to the old normal, right? At this idea that we're going back to an inflation that's sub 2% or even 2%, and other people pushing back. Where do you say to them, look, we're not going to have a high inflation regime for a very long time, and bonds will be able to reassert themselves in a way that we're used to? <clears throat> Well, because I do think that we are at or very close to the peak in inflation. And, you know, I think it's right to highlight just how much uncertainty we do have in terms of how far and how fast 
um, inflation falls. And that's obviously very critical for the Fed and other central banks and therefore for the outlook for um, the bond market. But I don't see a sort of self-fulfilling or self-perpetuating um, mm. wage price spiral. And if you think we're going into recession, as I think we are going into not only a European but also US and global recession, um, that's very negative in all sorts of ways. And, and, and sadly, right. people are going to be losing their jobs on the back of that. But we know from experience that does bring inflation down. Inflation is going to be coming down. It's just about right. the pace and the magnitude of that through next year. David, uh, tell me about the value of cash here. If we're quote unquote going into a recession, is cash good or is cash trash? Um, <laughs> I do think that as we go into um, recession, I think what is going to be of particular value is to have liquidity uh, within portfolios. Now, some of that's going to come from having holdings of um, uh, cash, but I also think it means a bias towards um, uh, credit, uh, core fixed income, which is now giving you a yield. I mean, one of the key differences, there's a lot of differences, but one of the key differences going into 2023 compared to when we went into <clears throat> Um, 2022, right. when we went into this year, is that we're actually starting with much higher levels of uh, yield. And that's giving you a an income cushion, uh, which you otherwise wouldn't, you know, didn't have right. at the start of um, 2022. So you yeah, have some liquidity, have some cash, I think a bias towards the more liquid securities. But I don't think it's an environment, I think there are opportunities out there for you to deploy cash. I wouldn't be holding too much cash. Right. Uh, David, we need you to get back to England, Iran. I know that's what you're really focused on here. We thank you for uh, coming on. We've got people outside. There's a ticketing snafu at the stadium. iPlayer is down worldwide. But also in minute three with McGuire advancing, David, somebody talks about a stone bonker of a penalty. Can, I mean, Pharaoh's not here, David. Save us. What does stone bonker mean? Um, th th you've caught me out there, Tom. I'm not sure what st Stonebonker actually means, but it sounds like it's a nailed-on um, uh, penalty that has been conceded. And, and by the Thank way you, you described it, um, it sounds like it may have been conceded by England, which would rather be in keeping with uh, the start that England often make to World Cup tournaments, a lot of a build-up and, and then some uh, disappointment when the game gets underway. Uh, let's hope I'm wrong and let's hope it's different this time around. David Riley with piercing analysis there in for John Farrell as well. <laughs> David Riley, Blue Bay Asset Manager. Can I make clear Farrell would exactly know what stone bonker means? A hundred percent. And he would give us a very great historical uh, picture of where that comes from. I just have to say, I'm getting quite a bit of hate mail about my dislike of Turkey. It's not that I dislike it. It's just that it's never good. It's just like it's adequate. Well, and people are suggesting that I don't brine it. And uh, someone suggests that I, I do a bourbon brine and then you would enjoy it. A bourbon too. brine. Uh, Take a sip people... <laughs> of bourbon, brine the beast. <laughs> and other people are saying, yeah, that's one way to do it. I don't know. Leftovers. I can't do the leftovers for two weeks. Oh, I don't know. I've had, I'm sorry. These are the things that we think about. It's the, you know, Thanksgiving, post, post Thanksgiving, post dinner, Ready? turkey exhaustion. We're going to solve this for Bramo right now, folks. And we say good morning and Thanksgiving week to Jerome Schneider. Oh, yeah. He's going to come give us advice. The website is gobble gobble. <laughs> they are Greenberg smoked turkeys. Lisa, the kids will love it. You'll be ordering turkey every 30 days from Texas. Smoked turkey. <laughs> what are Killer. they? Jerome Shopping Snyder. channel ahead of Thanksgiving. Here you network. go. <laughs> exactly. England or on. Stay tuned. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the UK isn't prepared to align itself with EU laws as part of their post-Brexit relationship. Following reports, his government is open to Switzerland-style ties with the bloc. Under my leadership, the United Kingdom will not pursue any relationship with Europe that relies on alignment with EU laws. Having the regulatory freedom to do that is an important opportunity of Brexit. And that's my agenda, and I'm confident that that agenda is not only right for the country, but can deliver enormous benefit for people up and down the UK in the years to come. Sunak spoke today at the Confederation of British Industries annual conference in Birmingham. 
Food giant Cargill says names name Brian Sykes as its new chief executive officer to replace David McLennan. Now, Cargill is America's largest private company. Sykes became chief operating officer a year after running Cargill's meat business. He will take on the top job on January 1st, and McLennan will become executive chair. Seven national football teams, including England, will not wear a rainbow armband, showing solidarity with LGBTQ rights, bowing to pressure from FIFA because players might receive a yellow card for the show of support. Qatar has been under intense scrutiny leading up to the World Cup over the treatment of migrant workers, as well as concerns about human rights and its criminalization of homosexuality. And it wasn't the start the hosts were hoping for on the pitch, beaten 2 to nothing by Ecuador in the opening match. Today, the U.S. takes on Wales. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. This is all over for the, the strong dollar trade. I think uh, uh, there's still a lot of pain to come in terms of the global economy. I think there's still a lot of hawkishness yet to come and, and feed through from the Fed. Jane Foley, Robo Bank there, no doubt watching England and Iran right now with John Farrow. We thank her always for her perspective as well. And Robo Bank, Lisa, has a really different approach. I say this all the time, but I think it's important. Our next guest is very, you know, speculation. How do you make money here, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the bottom line is uh, Jane Foley's working for a huge agricultural bank where it's about hedging business transactions to protect yourself. So it's the other side of the trade. You mean when derivatives actually had a concrete purpose in the world, when companies, if you're a lumber yard, you've got to actually hedge against the lumber prices going down in order to back that up. And that's really where perhaps the biggest mismatch is, particularly in oil, right? Where does the physical world yeah. and the financialized world, where do they kind of cohere and where are they really diverging? We're going to start strong this week with George Cervellos, Global Head of FX Research at Deutsche Bank. George, you're piecing it together with Dr. Folkert's Landau, with Alan Ruskin and the rest. What's your dollar theme of an outlook into 2023? Hi, good morning, Tom. Uh, it's a much more choppy uh, and sideways outlook. Uh, I think if you take a look back this year and, and look at when euro dollar made uh, the low around 95 in September um, and you know, think about what was going on back then. The UK had a fiscal crisis. European NAT gas prices were at 300. Um, they've now come down to 100. US CPI was still accelerating. China was still following strict zero COVID. So you had this confluence of risk negative events all adding up uh, together. And when we look at the biggest driver of the dollar this year, it's all been about the safe haven risk premium. So uh, the argument we've been making in recent weeks is, that risk premium in a cumulative sense has peaked. It's just going to be very hard for everything to be as bad at the same time next year as it was <clears> this year. And as a result, the dollar has most likely peaked. But I think that's a very, very different conversation to arguing that the dollar will enter into this big downtrend. Uh, and we don't see that happening, uh, at least over the next six months, over the first half right. of next year. What does EM do? Where's the opportunity here in beleaguered EM currencies? So I think in an environment where the dollar is choppier, essentially what we're saying is um, dollar correlations can go down. It's no longer one big trade. 2022 was essentially one big trade. Sell everything and just own dollar cash. And if that's changing, you're in an environment with a bit more differentiation in terms of stories. Um, European growth, uh, Europe potentially emerging from a recession, I think as soon as uh, Q1. China potentially accelerating. You're in an environment where some currencies can outperform in emerging markets that offer carry and real yield. And you want to be funding um, those longs, those high yielding currencies in things that still have very poor fundamentals. Uh, for example, the pound or the Swedish krona, which is faced with, with its own issues. So a much more tactical and idiosyncratic year, I think, compared to what has been a very, very one directional move 
um, so far in 2022. I love your your bullish call on other currencies and bearish call on the dollar is. It's very hard for everything to be as bad at the same time next year as it was this year. It's not exactly a screaming buy. I'm wondering, though, whether the euro is going to benefit the most from this lack of conviction around just hiding out in the dollar, especially, as you say, if they're emerging from recession in the first quarter. Uh, so the euro can take out negative risk premium, so to speak. If you think back to where we were in September, uh, nat gas prices, for example, are nearly two thirds down. Um, from a growth perspective, the market expected a very sharp recession from September, October onwards, onwards, which is materializing growth is shifting down to negative. But the reality is we've had a much bigger fiscal response than, we, than most people were expecting. Um, it seems like this window for escalation around uh, gas and the shortages it is closing. So potentially that story is looking better. Now, to make the argument that you're going all the way back up to 115, potentially 120, and reversing the entire move since the war, I think that's a much more aggressive argument that requires you to be very optimistic on, on how the conflict goes. But can you take risk premium out as you have? Can you stay above parity? I think the answer there is yes, because the environment is just not going to be as bad as it was uh, over the course of this year. A couple hours ago, uh, Carl uh, Weinberg joined us from High Frequency Economics and was talking about this stealth quantitative tightening that was going to take effect in the euro region come Wednesday, that about $300 billion of uh, loans to banks would be redeemed and they would get the bonds back that backed them, and that this was going to cause long-end yields to rise substantially, that people really hadn't understood this. What's your understanding of the quantitative tightening consequences in the euro region so this was uh, in this is in response to the tltro repayments yes. uh, were announced uh, on, on friday they were actually significantly lower than consensus they were around half the market was expecting 600 billion and we only had 300 billion of repayments so from an ecb perspective you're actually not getting as much quantitative tightening potentially as they would have hoped we need to wait and see what the december repayment numbers are going to be as well but either way, the point I would make on Europe is if you look at things like five-year, five-year um, GDP weighted real yields, they're actually not that high. If you look at the DAX, it's less than 10% down from the start of the year. So financial conditions in Europe have not tightened nearly as much as in the US. Um, that's another reason why potentially the ECB can stay hawkish. Now, whether that's via more QT or via rate, more rate hikes, it, it remains to be seen. But that's also a story that I think could be more supportive uh, for the euro compared to the Fed, where we're slowly mm. the conversation is evolving into uh, the question of when do we get the pause? I think cutting is a very different question, but at least can we enter a pause in this cycle? That's a much more valid debate to be having over 2023. George Servos, thank you so much. Really look forward to the Deutsche Bank view forward into 2023. He is, of course, in London with Deutsche Bank. Lisa, I'm watching the game here. John Farrell uh, waved to me from the stands, which is great. England zero, Iran zero. And what's fascinating here, you know, I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you, Steve Jobs and Tim Cook for doing Everyone's this. Everyone's thrilled that you're watching the game on and air while you're trying to Can we to do some business here? This, what, business. What's fascinating to me is that they look in the corners, Iran attacks, and there's a Budweiser advertising. And yet Friday we were talking about Budweiser couldn't sell beer mm -hmm. at the game. And right in the same corner is Crypto.com. I don't know who Crypto.com is. I went to their website. And this is the heart of the Katie Greifeld matter of Bitcoin. Receiving rewards up to 14.5% on your crypto assets. All of this Bitcoin debate we're having is about with us, you can make 8%. With us, you can make 10%. In this case, there it is on the website. With us, you can make 14.5%. I think you you and I call this a free lunch. Right. How can you get rich quick? I'm just still distracted by the fact that you've been watching the game this whole time. Well, no, I wasn't. You know, I, I'm sliding game? in there. Is it a good game? It's it's diff very different from Ecuador Cutter. More and, and energy the, on both sides? The, yeah, way more skill. I mean, I you know, what do I know? Do you, do you <laughs> well, I don't know. John, you get. come on. Yeah, exactly. He'll phone it's like in. It's come on. He'll do a John. Phone John, come on. They're heading into the end zone <laughs> with the Dow. John, John, come on. <laughs> yeah, John. God. That's not working. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance. Futures are negative 20 now, negative 13. So I guess that's an advance in a very churning uh, market waiting for information uh, as well. On the data front, I'm going to give you American oil at 79.50 uh, per barrel, under $80. That gets my attention. And again, the yen, Sarah Vellis didn't play it up much at Deutsche Bank, but we had a 142 yen there, which is a weaker yen, first time in, I'm going to say, two weeks. How much does that have to do with China and the idea <laughs> that any kind of of reassertion of COVID lockdowns yeah. could end up really reducing some dynamism there. Half back to the full back. Yeah, that's full back this is what you're going to be dealing with center, for literally back full back. another 90 minutes. Half to the Tom. full back, half back. And I'm sure everyone's really enjoying this. We're England, still on air. England you know that, right? keeps kicking the ball back to their goalie. I didn't think that was the <laughs> That's way. a classic move. Even I know that. Really, oh. honestly, people are now throwing things at the screen. I am so sorry. Now I'm going to take Jonathan Farrow's role. I'm really sorry to hold Veronica you. Veronica Clark <laughs> really looking at us as appreciate well. Appreciate football. Now, see Veronica, there it is. <laughs> Why are we we're, doing that? we're watching the game. They haven't had a shot yet. England's trying, though. Tom? We'll have to see. Okay, Veronica Clark with us, <laughs> working with Andrew Hollenhorst at Citigroup as they adjust to their call of the year. I would suggest maybe with Deutsche Bank out front first with a ramification of global slowdown and particularly the vector of interest rates higher. That's what everybody wants to know. You sit with Hollenhorst uh, mm -hmm. over uh, a Starbucks coffee in the morning and you say, where's the terminal rate? Where's the new Citigroup terminal rate? Yeah, we, we have the terminal rate now at 525 to 550 and getting there by the May meeting of 2020. Why is Bullard wrong when he th talks about 7% X number of days ago? I mean, he, he might not be wrong. He's been kind of a, a leading sign for the Fed this year. Um, and I think it's fair to think that, you know, the rate needs to get to anywhere from 5 to 7 but the lag effects, not to channel Leo Brainerd here, but there is a question of how much companies are already feeling a lot of tightening and they're ratcheting back their plans for next year's and year and may have to really cut some staff. So from your vantage point, how do you dismiss that as a relevant factor for the Fed? I think that is very relevant, though. Um, I mean, we're, we're anecdotally hearing that people are cutting back now, but you really haven't seen it in the data yet. Um, and that's really what's going to be most important for us, most important for the Fed, is just what are you seeing in the inflation data? And then, you know, also importantly, the labor market data. And we, we still have really low initial jobless claims. It, it still seems the job openings are high. And, and there's not enough loosening yet. But this is the important point when you talk about tech layoffs. And we've talked extensively. We've got Amazon cutting 10,000 jobs. You have Twitter, of course, its own story. You have oh, Meta uh, cutting thousands of jobs. How much do you look at this and say it's a tech story? And it's a tech story that could deepen, but it's tech isolated. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to see, you know, first the weakness in sectors like tech or, or real estate, of course, you know, the housing market would be most affected first by, by rate hikes. Um, but eventually, you know, you probably do see it broadening out to, to the rest of the economy. Um, we think we see that really, you know, as we're getting into 2023. When you talk to your markets people, how do they link the Holland Horse Clark analysis into what the stock market will do. That is part of economics, even at New York University. <laughs> yeah, no, it absolutely does matter. And, and the story of the last year has been, of course, higher rates. That's tighter financial conditions, lower equities. Um, the last couple of weeks, you know, after CPI, you know, maybe we've reversed some of that. Um, but I still think, you know, the, the momentum is maybe, you know, risk assets still lower. What does investment do? Business investment next yeah. year. 11, I mean, it, what, 11 percent of the economy, 15 percent? Yeah, yeah, roughly. I mean, it, it should be slowing. And we've already seen that, of course, in any housing related investment that was very weak in Q3 GDP should be weak again in Q4. Um, but yeah, eventually, especially given that goods demand has come off, you, you should see you know, businesses pulling back less, less manufacturing activity, that type of thing. And this is a segment where we go into housing and Tom <laughs> talks about how he expects uh, something uh, more significant. And a lot of people are saying, yes, that seems to be the most logical conclusion from a 7% mortgage rate and other people saying no because of just the behavioral aspect of this, which we were talking about earlier. People are going to stay put. There's going to be less mobility. Mm -hmm. If there are fewer homes for sale, you're not going to necessarily see the realized price declines. How do you game that out in this controversial moment of really historic weakness for the housing market? Yeah, I think there is still more weakness to come. Um, but yeah, it, it will matter, you know, what's happening on the supply side where you, know, you do get this pullback in construction also. Um, and so there's less 
less housing stock and maybe then prices don't fall as much. But we what we have seen so far is that you know home sales are falling, construction's falling, and prices are also falling. But could you see a real route, not necessarily akin to the 2007-2008 leverage fueled destruction, but something more significant <clears throat> after the bid up that we saw during the pandemic and then the Dallas report, the Dallas Fed mm -hmm. report, that really highlights how it could spiral, especially as people get less optimistic about how much their homes are worth. Yeah, I wouldn't expect that you know we're in a 2008 type you know scenario. That was a pretty housing specific um, bubble that that popped. Um, but of course, housing is is weak and it tends to be somewhat of a leading indicator for the rest of activity. Um, but I think more what's happening is you know housing <clears throat> is just the first to feel the impact of Fed rate hikes, and eventually you see it in you know con consumption that's slowing down, other business investment that's slowing down, people losing their jobs. But it's all coming back to that what the Fed has done. So what's the path to December 14th? It's a sleepy Monday. Futures improved negative 20 out to negative 14. We're going to get Wednesday. You're cooking Thursday, right? Do you start cooking Wednesday? <laughs> yes, um, probably tomorrow even. <laughs> You're going to start? That, that's sick. Yeah. Really? I have a very small oven, so I need to, to plan these things. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk to Holland Horse about <laughs> that. I mean, I can see Miss Clark with the Viking, you know, the big... You know, six burner I'm Viking. Still, I'm sorry. I'm still weeding through all the hate mail that I got about Turkey. <laughs> well, so it's really, Better, carry on. You know, but, 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 <laughs> but seriously here, we got to stagger to December 14th. Is mm -hmm. this a snooze fest? Or is there actually going to be some real change in the tone as we get to December 14th? Yeah, I think it, it could be an interesting couple of weeks. This week is you know relatively slow on important data. Of course, we'll get Fed minutes on Wednesday. Um, that November Fed meeting you know, feels like a long time ago. Um, but it could be a, an opportunity to somewhat hawkishly push back on markets. Next week, of course, we'll get a lot of labor market data. That will be very important. Um, the the payrolls number. I think it's openings. more important just in the last week, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're really looking for, you know, I think for the Fed right now, if we do get some slowing in inflation, which it seems like we might, but you not, you're not seeing it in the slowing in service inflation, that's related to a tight labor market. And then you do need to see that loosening in the labor market data. Okay, but you know, just want, you know, I got something else I want to chat on, but I think this is really, really important. What part of the jobs report should our listeners and viewers study? Yeah, I mean, all of it matters, which is oh, <laughs> I know that's what Holland would say. Give <laughs> me know. a value add here. Yeah, from Andrew all Holland of it Horst. matters. I think most, maybe most interesting, what I would be watching first is what happens with the unemployment rate. Um, it did tick up um, last month for October. Um, if it if it all's back again, that's still a really tight mm -hmm. labor market. What's the one issue? that the team over at City argues about the most, where there's the most good disagreement? Good question. Thank you. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think we're, we're relatively in, in consensus. I think maybe, you know, it could be hard as we're getting into next year to know, you know, exactly what the Fed is doing when you get more of this debate between the hawks and the doves. Um, and I think we, we do want to remember that, you know, we've, we've been very hawkish this year. The Fed has been, too. Um, but this could mm -hmm. be somewhat of an inherently dovish Fed. Um, you know, this is a Fed that cut rates three times in 2019 um, we might get more debate you know among ourselves too just exactly you know how yeah. the how it plays out next year there's going to be a discussion around the thanksgiving table this comes up every single year you're sarah with the cherubs the cherubs never talk to you anymore and you're going to talk <laughs> about education you did one of the toughest grinds mathematics and economics mm -hmm. at chapel hill mm -hmm. and then economics at nyu how do we keep women engaged in mathematics to get them through high school and into college. I mean, I know there's a huge improvement there, mm -hmm. but what was it that kept you engaged in mathematics? I had really great teachers in high school, um, and I don't, I'm don't. i not an education expert. I don't know how you, know, how you mm -hmm. improve that, but I think it, it does matter just having really great teachers um, who I struggled at points, you know, but then they, they you know, brought me back up. <laughs> did you get through imaginary numbers like square root of minus one? You survived? Yes, <laughs> yeah. I did not do complex analysis, but of course mm -hmm. I had to do a real analysis class. <laughs> okay. Veronica Clark on the complex analysis of December 14th uh, is, well, you nailed complex analysis in Chicago, right? Well, my father's a mathematician, so I lived it. We had I, lots of discussions. I got to table. cubic functions. You know, I, I mm. nailed it all. I was like first in the class, blah, and then cubic functions showed up. <laughs> it was like, oh, really? Remember that? <laughs> yeah, you, very. You're like, you've got a completely <laughs> down analytical geometry, then... 
Oh. <laughs> Amazingly, I don't use complex analysis now in forecasting. Well, let Horowitz so. do that. What does he mean? <laughs> Veronica Clark, thank you so much with Citigroup uh, today. Lisa, what do you see here on this Monday morning? It's a quiet Monday. Look, we're not going to try to overplay the action. What I do think is interesting, actually, I keep going back to what Katie Kaminsky said, this idea that she's seeing mixed signals on the short term and the long term. And to me, that's fascinating. The other thing that's fascinating to me is to see how closely you're scrutinizing your phone right now to watch the game rather than, well, you know, anything else. <clears throat> Else, because honestly, that's probably what most people are doing. They're no, no, we're going to do both. We do yeah. both. You know, you, you listen to Bloomberg Radio <laughs> while you're watching the desk. team, while you're watching the screen. I mean, England came in with a corner kick and they hit the crossbar. That sounds like the, the England end we know and love. And then they scored a goal. I didn't see the goal because I was talking to uh, uh, Miss Clark here about um, the Fed meeting. December 14th. I was, <laughs> I was distracted by our guest. What is that about? I know, but you know, this is what people are watching. They're watching the game. Imagine, and they're imagine next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although we're mm. actually getting labor market data rather than this week. We're getting Fed minutes on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I know you you're going to be glued, bear, it, it, glued ser, to it. It's going to be amazing. Seriously, I don't know where we are in time. Uh, let's go back to Miss Clark on this. I mean, Wednesday, <laughs> you're trying to get out to cook the beast, and there's like 4,000 data dump economic statistics. I know. We Which have one so matters? Data. We have so much data. Um, I mean, the Fed minutes that day at two are probably the most important See? thing. Oh, you're killing Look me. Look at that. Uh, of the Do data. Do you read the Fed minutes? <laughs> of course she does. I skim them. <laughs> Thank you. But There's you know, the honest answer. But in all honesty, this is why she starts cooking now, because she's got to read the Fed meeting exactly. minutes at 2 p.m. and scour the data. You look <laughs> totally convinced, Tom. She skims them. Are you, is that I a ticket for you to skim, skim them? them. Heavily <laughs> skim them. Heavily skim. I almost went to UCLA where you have to lean over the desk. And look at the base. What book. is heavily and, skimming? You know, like several, <laughs> some, you know, a few. Some few, many. Uh, you know, look, I, I think, okay, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Let's save that. ourselves with a data check. We do that with oil under $80 a barrel in America, $79.50 as well. Dollar stronger is an important tone today, led by weak yen, 141.77 on yen. Nowhere near the 148 level. But a bit of a reversal on the dollar uh, weakness we've seen the last number of days. Must watch, must listen. Peter Oppenheimer in the 9 o'clock hour with Lisa Abramowitz Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Indonesia, at least 46 people are dead and about 700 others injured after a 5.6 magnitude earthquake shook the western Java region today. Several homes, stores and public buildings are damaged and landslides are reported following the roughly seven second earthquake. Tremors were felt in nearby cities, including the capital of Jakarta. Ukraine plans to raise transit fees for Russian oil through the Drusba pipeline to Eastern Europe next year due to Moscow's attacks on the nation's power supplies. The operator of Ukraine's oil pipeline network informed its Russian counterpart that, quote, continued destruction of the Ukrainian energy infrastructure has led to a significant shortage of electricity and increasing costs, a shortage of fuel, spare parts. That's according to a letter from the company seen by Bloomberg. Twitter's head of France announced his departure. Damien Vielle led the region for about seven years. A number of workers at the Paris office, which had fewer than 50 employees before billionaire Elon Musk took over last month, are focused on advertiser relationships. Musk is considering additional layoffs and has already slashed Twitter's workforce in half. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. economy is still the most resilient economy in the world. Having said that, our economists are predicting a shallow recession in, uh, in 2023 because this U.S. economy is still very quite interconnected with the rest of the world. We expect a rebound in, in 2024. 
He is from France and New York, Jean-Yves Filion, providing guidance to BMP Paribas USA as their chief executive officer. Always a good conversation, and particularly we tilted it towards France. Could they repeat in the World Cup? They had a very tough injury uh, this weekend, and we'll have to see on that. For those of you watching, thank you for watching. England are in. England pulls away 3-0. Uh, right now, we've been watching that uh, as we can here. Lisa Abramowitz with trenchant analysis is preparing for the 9 o'clock hour. I'll prepare for England and Wales this afternoon. That'll be fun. Right now, and this is not fun because it's William Cohen taking on a very difficult topic, which is power failure. And this is simply the collapse of an institution of my childhood power failure. William Cohen, thank you so much for 700 plus pages on this. My childhood was moving west on the New York State Thruway by the industrial might of Jack Welch's America, the GE factory in Schenectady and all Welch coming from Pittsfield, Massachusetts as well. When did they begin to fail? Was it the financialization of a light bulb maker? Well, Tom, you know, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to see you again. Uh, look, I think, you know, GE Credit, which became GE Capital, started in the Depression to help uh, finance uh, people's acquisition of uh, GE products, of appliances, et cetera. Uh, Jack, however, when he took it over, recognized that there was a huge arbitrage opportunity between GE's uh, AAA credit rating and its low cost of capital and what it could lend that money out uh, at large spreads, including with warrants, uh, Tom, which was something that Mike Melkin uh, perfected. And I started my career on Wall Street at G Capital Financing Leverage Buyouts, so I actually did it myself for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Jack built that business up so that it was almost 50% of GE's profits. And he understood that business. I think he understood the risks of that business. Right. And he also had people like Gary Went in charge there who understood the risks in that business. The people side of your book is absolutely phenomenal. Page 296, a guy named Bob Nardelli joins up, Old Forge, Pennsylvania, between Wilkes-Barre and Scranton. You turn the page and you've got Walter Mac Mac McNerney going to New Trier and when that, uh, my mother went there um, as well. It's a people book. Which is the person we should focus on when we look at the collapse of Generous Electric? Well, you know, uh, it takes a village sometimes. I mean, Jeff Immelt was obviously the CEO uh, for 17 years from 2001 till uh, 2017. So, I mean, he he gets the lion's share of the blame, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, did Jack sort of set him up for failure? That's a question that people are wondering right. about and asking. How does the applied mathematician from Dartmouth screw up so bad? Did it, was it a single mistake that Mr. Immelt made, or was he just a victim mm -hmm. of the times? You know, I think he made a series of what he thought were the right decisions, but that turned out in retrospect to be the wrong decisions, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, buying Alstom, uh, selling NBC Universal too cheaply, uh, kind of freaking out during the 2008 financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, getting out of GE Capital, bringing in try on Nelson Peltz, thinking that Nelson Peltz would ratify his vision for GE and then promising uh, earnings per share that he couldn't achieve. Uh, that was the end. I mean, it's not dissimilar to what just happened with Bob Chapek and, and Bob Ike. Well, or Disney. I mean, let's rip up the script here, Bill Cohen. You can do this. I'm sure you're going to write on Iger and Disney here in in five years. House of Cards, money and power. Now power failure. Could this process exist today, or are the markets so open and visible, particularly to activism, that we couldn't redo GE Welch to Immelt? Well. You know, GE was really a very large company when uh, Jack, uh, when Jeff thought it would be a good idea to invite Nelson Peltz to come into the equity of GE in 2015 to ratify his decision to sell GE Capital. Right. Uh, you know, th that didn't have to happen. Uh, so, I mean, Dan Loeb obviously went into uh, uh, Disney earlier this year, spent a billion dollars. 
saw the stock go down 40% and moved to, to act. Nelson Peltz did the same thing when he saw that <clears throat> Jeff Immel no longer had control of the company, right. and he did it again, unfortunately, when uh, you know it was time for Jack, John Flannery to leave after 15 months. Bill Cohen, not to sell one of your ex-books, I know that's tacky in a book interview, but I've got to go to Money and Power and your definitive guide to Wall Street's Goldman Sachs. Your thoughts on the present state of Goldman Sachs, the market's challenges, and perhaps the cultural challenge that David Solomon uh, faces right now. What do you look forward to from Mr. Solomon and Goldman Sachs? Constantly evolving, Tom. You know this as well as anyone. Goldman is extremely nimble. David is a very uh, clever, smart guy. Uh, you know, has he made missteps? You know, of course. I mean, uh, he tried to get the bank into uh, more retail banking with Marcus and making loans and cash management. Maybe that's a tougher business than he thought. You know, his trading business had a great quarter last quarter. Investment banking has had a rough year across the street. Uh, trading helped Goldman. Trade, Goldman is a perfectly uh, designed creature to take advantage of opportunities in the financial markets. They have been doing that for 160 plus years. They will continue to do it. They are the one of the oldest surviving financial institutions we have in this country. They know how to survive. I'm going to call this the Daniel Jurgen equivalent. William Cohen with his folks, power and failure. Bill Cohen, thank you, Cohen. Thank you so much. The thickness will fear you. 700 plus pages of Cohen. I won't mince words. It reads like Daniel Jurgen. It just reads wonderfully supple, wonderfully fluid here uh, from all the different people, including Bob Nardelli, and on and on to the collapse of this American uh, icon. Power failure, the rise and fall of an American icon. I really can't say enough about it uh, here uh, today. Uh, futures negative 12. The tape's a little improved here, and the tape is quiet. You can see on the Bloomberg launch pad the red and the green, the way it pulsates, what kind of day it is. And it's a day waiting for a lot of economic data into Tuesday and a ton of data, as we heard from Veronica Clark, on Wednesday as well, and then on uh, to Friday and on seriously into a tumultuous December. It's going to be interesting to see where we sit on December 15th as well. Let me do a complete data check. We sort of avoided that today. My Pharaoh would have never done that. Pharaoh, even watching England or Iran, Pharaoh would have done a complete data check. Futures improved negative 13, Dow futures negative 11, SPX 24 on the VIX now 23.83, a more constructive tape in the last hour. Bonds, boring. We won't go there. I'm going to go to the dollar stronger today by a good seven-tenths of a percent on DXY. Euro under 103, 102.55. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.